Okay, I'd like to apologize for our late uh, start tonight. We were coming out of closed session and um, we wanted, we were addressing some expulsion cases, which we have um, been talking about the fact that they do take some of our time. Um, I would like to uh, make a special note that we do not have our regular translator here this evening, but um, Mr. Gonzalez, Michael Gonzalez will be available to uh, translate for anyone who needs it, and he will come forward and introduce himself at this time. Gracias por parte de la mesa directiva. Uh, bienvenidos a, a esta junta. Si necesitan ayuda a traducir, por favor, levanten la mano y podemos comunicar. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias, Michael. Um, also, I'd like to point out that we have headsets available for anyone who needs assistive hearing technology. And again, I want to point out that it is um, identified on our screen. Okay, uh, announcement of closed session action. We do not have any, um, any I'm sorry, yes we do, I take that back. We do have one action to, um, to report out from our closed session and that is the board, the board voted unanimously to approve the consideration of a Casey waiver for graduation for students with disabilities. Um, and I don't think we have to identify the numbers of the, the student names or I mean number, case number. We don't have it listed here. The vote was unanimous, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then that brings us to the um, acceptance of donations. Uh, move to accept with gratitude a very, very long list. Second. Yes. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Bob, did we get your? Oh, okay. Um, and again, we'd like to thank our very, very generous community um, that the motion carries 5-0. That brings us to introductions, proclamations, presentations, and recognitions. Um, Dr. Sarvis will be making a presentation this evening to the board. Well, I do have two recognitions tonight. Is this on? Great. The first recognition is for our illustrious Health Academy, San Marcos High School Health Academy Board. You have a flyer that describes the Health Academy. You'll find that very informative. And I would like to bring uh, Sue Dockenhaus, a San Marcos High School teacher, uh, up to the podium along with current and, foreign, uh, and former students. She'll tell us about the certified nursing assistant portion of the Health Academy. And while they're on their way up, I would like to acknowledge two instructors in the audience, Kelly Graves and Mary Weber from the Certified Nursing Assistant Program at Santa Barbara City College. So with that, Sue Dockenhaus. Ladies, why don't you stand on this side? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarvis and uh, board members. Um, as he said, my name is Sue Dockenhaus, and I'm the director of the Health Careers Academy at San Marcos High School. And I'm uh, happy to be accompanied this year by 12 of the 15 students that are in the uh, Health Academy CNA Certified Nursing Assistant Program this year. This is our sixth year. Again, Dr. Sarvis introduced Kelly Graves. Kelly, you want to stand up? She is the director at City College, and Mary Weber, <laughs> another instructor. And of course, we would like to uh, say hello to our principal in the back, Mr. Uh, Craig Morgan. Okay, so as Dr. Sarvis said, you have a couple of sheets in front of you, and uh, one of them tells you the sequencing of the classes at the academy. It is a three-year program, and uh, there are many advantages to this. The academy began in 2001, thanks to the collaboration between Santa Barbara City College, uh, Cottage Hospital, and the Regional Occupation Program. Uh, 
the CNA program is just one facet of the program, but that's what we're focusing on this evening. And your second paper shows you <coughs> the CNA graduates from 2001, uh, 2002, what they are doing and how many students there were. And, and you can see it's quite impressive that most of them have stayed with, with the medical field. Um, so right now I'd like to introduce uh, this uh, couple of our students from this class, Jessica Ronis and Nicole Hammock. <laughs> Nicole Hammock. And they're going to tell you a little, about, a little bit about what it's like to be a CNA, okay? Let's use the microphone so we can Thank capture you. this. Thank you. Hi. There's a DVD that will be handed to you at a later time right now, specifying more in depth of what we do. Here are some pictures that shows you our typical work days. Here is a picture of the kiosk in front of Santa Barbara City College where we arrive at 7 a.m. to get our parking tickets and be in class. Here's a picture of the class that we're in. These are pictures of us learning how to take vital signs, which is the major part of being a CNA. Then we be, we're at City College three days out of the week from 7 a.m. to 9.15. Afterwards, we go to San Marcos for our rest of our classes there. On Saturdays, we arrive at San Marcos Retirement Home from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Here, we take the residents out for walks on the beautiful campus that they have to give them a breath of fresh air. We practice our proper hand washing technique and proper hygiene. We assist the residents with feeding because most of them are dependent on our help. We practice our proper bed making with our miter corners so the residents don't get tangled in their blankets. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, we fill out a chart specifying and date the dates of all the activities that we do throughout the day. Some advantages of the CNA program are we receive six units of college credit. The only expense to us are our scrubs, which we're all wearing, and fingerprints. The college and the hospital pays for the rest. By this time, I'm eligible for acceptance into the ADN program, associate's degree in nursing, once I complete my prerequisites, which are chem, math 107, English 110, anatomy and physiology, and microbiology. This means I get priority on the waiting list. At the end of December, I'll take my state certification test. Upon passing, I understand from Ms. Dockenhouse that all the students have passed. Thanks to Kelly and Mary, I will be able to get a job as a CNA in the community once I turn 18. The salary range is from $12 to $14 an hour. In January, I'll do a nine-week internship at Cottage Hospital. And in May, I will graduate from City College, and my family and friends will be giving a reception by the college. We speak, Jessica and I, for the other girls that we're thankful and happy to have this program and to be able to participate in it. Thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rachel Goodwin and Karen Garcia. These two students will graduate this December from the RN program at Santa Barbara City College. Their instructor let them leave the hospital tonight early so they could come and speak to you about what the Health Academy has done for them. Take it away, girl. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Garcia. Um, as Ms. Hawkins now said, I'm a former graduate of the CNA program. And I just want to tell you everything that the CNA program has given me. I had the opportunity to get an experience in a health career, and luckily I learned a lot from it. Also how to take vital signs, how to properly care for a patient in need. And because of that, it just made me want to become more of a nurse. And it just opened up all my options and hopes of what the future can provide for me. And thank you very much, even though we have to wake up sometimes at 7 a.m., but <laughs> it's worth it. Because we know that the patients appreciate everything we do for them. But thank you very much for everything you provided, and congratulations to all the students. Because they are really hardworking, and we do need all the help we can get. So thank you very much. Hello, I'm Rachel, and I'm going to explain what a day in a life is like in our program is like. Um, our program is comprised of four different levels and usually takes two to three years for someone to finish the ADN program at City College. 
because it's a self-paced program. So we have different modules in each program. We have the psychiatric module, fluid electrolytes, and there's different modules for each level. And um, we take a test after each module. And so two days a week at school, we spend um, four hours or so learning at, in our classes, the modules one at a time. And then we spend our time in the lab, the same lab we used when we were CNAs, learning all of our skills. And then two days a week, we spend um, about eight hours a day at the hospital and doing um, all of our rotations through all the units. So we have our early mornings as well, just in the ADN program. And I'm very appreciative of, of the CNA program. It has helped us a lot. It's, it's been very beneficial to us. So we're thankful and thank everyone for this opportunity. Thank you. And now the girls have a little gift for the board members. So take them up, girls. <laughs> board, this program is truly a partnership between the school district, the city college, and the healthcare community. I, re I meet regularly with Ron Werft, and he speaks highly of our program. Ms. Cordero? Well, I want to say thank you on so many levels for this. I mean, it seems like we are assisting the community. We're assisting our school district. We're assisting the students. I mean, as, a, as an instructor at Santa Barbara City College, I am so proud of my colleagues for the work that they're doing to work with our district. And on behalf of the district, I'm uh, grateful for the work and, and so proud of the students who are uh, involved in this extremely worthwhile um, field of study. You bring a tremendous service to people who really benefit from it and really need it and too often go so, um, sort of uncared for. So this is something that you are really benefiting our entire society. And the students who are currently studying at Santa Barbara City College, um, I, wa I appreciate uh, you as well having gone through this program and now uh, matriculating on. Again, uh, this is, I have three sisters who are in the nursing field and so I definitely uh, appreciate the work that you are doing um, and I know that it takes very special people to do it well so thank you to your instructors to the hard work that you do um, to the students who are who have matriculated and to really also to your parents and uh, those who support you as well your teachers etc so thank you very much and congratulations And we look forward to seeing you caring for all of us when we, hopefully not very often, have to have care. Or very soon. <laughs> or very soon. Thank you. Did you catch that cue from Mrs. Dockenhouse? It's homework time. And thank you very much for the thank gifts. You. Well, board, there's someone else I'd like to introduce you to, to you tonight. And that is Mark Lewis. You probably saw an article, a recent article, in the uh, news press on Mark Lewis. Mark, would you come forward? Santa Barbara High School senior Mark Lewis saw a need for study aids and in true entrepreneurial fashion stepped in to fill it with let's scram, let's cram, excuse me. <laughs> let's cram dot com. Uh, board, I want to tell you about Mark. Uh, Mike, I'm sorry, Mike. Mike. Mike was Santa Barbara High's class president in grades 9 and 10, member of the varsity mock trial team, senior panel, and active in the school's diversity program. He's hoping to attend either Dartmouth, uh, Princeton, or Williams College in the fall where he plans to major in economics and or English. Mike, tell us about what you did. Oh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for, um, for letting us come here tonight and let's introduce the other fine young men that are with me here. Hi, my name is Adam Freed, and uh, Mike told me uh, about the site um, last May, about May, March, April. Um, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, when he told me about the site, I thought it was just such a great idea. I jumped on board right away, and um, I've been helping him ever since. Hi, everyone. My name's Alice Korczynski. Um, Mike told me about the site in April. I'm pretty sure it was before Adam. Um, <laughs> 
I thought as well, I thought it was a great idea. Um, did everything I could to help him with it, and here we are today. So I'll just let Mike talk about the site for five minutes or so. Yeah. yeah. I know you guys are busy, so I'll try to be quick here. Um, well, first of all, thanks again for letting us come here. Um, as, as you'll see about the website, it really depends on the support of, of not just students, but administrators and teachers. And um, as you can see as we go on, um, I appreciate all your time and, and your ears tonight. Uh, basically, the site started out as just an idea that I had um, when I was studying for a history test last spring. I was studying for the test and reviewing a sheet of notes, but um, what kind of bothered me was that the notes, you know, they're fun and you can stare at them and as, as long as you wanted, but after a while, there was something else you wanted to do. You, know, you wanted to talk to someone, you wanted to, you know, get on the computer and type with someone and, and get that interactive feel going, and the notes really didn't do that. The textbook, you know, was all, was great and everything, but pictures just, you know, I wanted something a little bit more interactive. and. Um, I went online, but it was a little too late, so I couldn't catch any of my friends. And um, that's when it kind of hit me to try to make a website or just a place where students like me that were studying, because I knew there must have been some kids out there that were having the same things I, were going, I was going through, to meet up and kind of discuss their thoughts on school subjects and kind of have almost like an online coffee shop where everyone comes in and throws around their, their ideas. So that was the original idea for Let's Cram, and I thought it was kind of nice because the name says it all. You're sitting there at 11 o'clock and you're cramming as much as you can in, but you want you want someone else to do it. You want to feel like there's more than just you out there, and it's not just this cutthroat race to get you know A's or whatever it is. It's it's we're all in it. You know we're all in it together, and that's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, we kept working on the idea, and and basically uh, by the by the early I guess early summer, and then into the early fall, we launched it. And um, September 4th was our official launch. We went into Santa Barbara High School and. Um, we promoted it as much as we can. We said, you know, guys, this is a site that can, you know, help you out, but also give you a place to go when it's time to do homework. There are sites out there for a lot of different reasons on the website, but none really to get homework done. So what this provides is it provides a place for students, regardless of, of where they are at school, what grade they're in, where they live, or what kind of person they are, to come in and get their, you know, questions answered, but more just kind of feel like they're part of something bigger than just that. It breaks down any barriers that they might have, any backgrounds that they come from, and lets everyone kind of communicate in one open discussion area. Um, as we can show you here, the, the website's based in pretty basic format. You can, as we know, there's you know many different types of classes, but basically everyone's studying the same type of stuff in high school. On the left, you see that there's um, subjects such as English, history, math, science, languages, etc. You can roll over one of those subjects, and under maybe history, this would come up. So. If you clicked on actually physics, you'd see that there's a lot of messages that are, are under physics. And what you could do is you could click on one if you knew the answer to it. Someone said finding displacement. Well, it doesn't really matter where you go to school, but you know, physics is physics regardless of any city you're in or any state you're in. What was nice is that kids from San Marcos were helping Santa Barbara. Kids from New York were helping kids in California. And right initially after the, uh, the launch, September 4th, we had um, about uh, 100 to 200 kids sign up in the first couple weeks, and word of mouth kind of carried it from there. It wasn't just kind of a one-time thing as kids started to feel that this was a resource to, to use and to take advantage of. It's absolutely free to join. Uh, we don't ca charge anything to our members. And after a while, it wasn't just students, but actually teachers that started to use the site as an academic resource to give their kids when they, when they couldn't get to every single question in class, or they couldn't answer every single thing, and they wanted to get a little bit more of uh, instruction, this was the place to go. So a lot of teachers started to tell their kids, if you still have problems on it, go on tonight. And not only will you find other kids there to help you out, but you know, a lot of teachers said, I'm going to take the initiative and I'm going to go on later tonight. So now we have, st we have students interacting with other students that are you know, focused on their specific school subject, but also teachers from various schools that are starting to take part in, and become you know, one and the same in this discussion area, making it even more of a uh, beneficial resource, not only for students now, but for teachers who are starting to take less time to go over questions that are already being answered on Let's Cram the night before so they can be more efficient in their classroom uh, discussions and lectures. Um, one of the beautiful things about Let's Cram is that it really does let any student that needs to study for something post a question, get help on it, and, and discuss it with other kids. If you have a soccer match or you have play practice, you can post a question just like this in the physics uh, room, and you can go to your play practice and come back, and you can see kids from all over the country, all different grades in high school, and you know, just from every background possible, saying what they have to say about you know, whether it be the Bay of Pigs fiasco or, you know, the, you know, literature or Shakespeare or anything, kids are, are able to talk about it. This is a, um, once you click on a subject, you can see kind of the thread here. Someone posted, actually that was me, <laughs> the uh, original one. Uh, the original question says, you know, I don't understand this. And I was able to post it and then go, you know, go, I, I was playing, uh, I think we had a mock trial scrimmage, so I was able to go do that. 
And then later in the day, someone else from Santa Barbara High School said, you know, this, I think, this is my take on it, but that's what I think. If you were able to see the full sheet, you were able to see about five to six other responses of other students contributing what they want to know. Uh, the beauty about the internet is that it brings people together in any interest. And what I find interesting about Let's Cram is that it differs from any other site in, out there on the World Wide Web. It, it brings together people that have information to share and that want to talk about it, and it brings it together in an educational environment. We've had over 1,000 uh, registered users in Santa Barbara and as well as the rest of uh, Southern California and across the country, and we keep growing every day. We've had uh, over 700,000 hits, and uh, I don't know what that means, but they tell me it's a good thing. So, <laughs> you know, what I'm here to do is just is to ask for your support and your enthusiasm, just as we've picked it up before, in spreading the word about Let's Cram and using any um, medium you can to get the word out, because as more people find out, the more beneficial this website becomes. And with every new person that joins, that's one more mind that we get to pick through and get information from and get another person contributing to this one big study session. And um, now there are kids that come on here right after school just to see what's going on. We have an open forum, a question of the week, we have current events. So what it really is is extending the classroom but into an in your home environment. And that home doesn't have to be in this, pers in this section of the city. It doesn't have to be from you know, Santa Barbara County. It can be from, you know, I think the beauty is when someone posts a question in New York and someone from Wisconsin answers it a couple minutes later. Now, we're not there yet, but it's happened and it, it will continue to happen as far as, you know, if we can keep the growth going. Um, this is a website that's based off of people that want to contribute to something that's, you know, uh, a big, one big concept, which is making, you know, student life a little less stressful, maybe a little more fun, more social, but in the end, more uh, beneficial for everyone involved. And we've been doing that, and I wanted to, again, thank you for letting us come here. Uh, this is something that I really think everyone can benefit from. And um, I mean, if you guys had any other words of, uh, as I see it. Sorry if I'm rambling, I just get excited, so. <laughs> um, and you know, if you have any questions, please let me know. There's a lot of, yeah, what's up? I just wanted to ask, is this something that you're hoping community members and practitioners in the field would also log in and maybe be able to post answers? Or are you trying to keep this more between in the field students of education? and teachers? Oh, well, actually, we've, that was an interesting subject because the original idea was that there's so many kids out there that want to communicate. But then once a couple teachers said, hey, this is a great thing. I want to use it for my students. And they started posting the homework assignments because so many kids from Santa Barbara High were coming on here that it made sense for them, you know, hey, if you're not going to listen in class, I want to make sure you get it. <laughs> so what people actually did was they said, all right, it's a class assignment to sign up because now when I post the homework, you have no excuses tomorrow because I know you're coming on the website. But to answer your question, yes, I mean, we're looking for any, anyone in the realm of education to, to help out, to, to use their, you know, whatever they have to offer. The whole thing is just kind of one big mural, and I guess it paints some sort of picture of education and everybody from every sort of, of walk of life, from every different profession is helping out. You know, whether it be a college student that just wants to give back in their expertise of trigonometry, they can go and post it. Or if it's someone that has something to say, they can write a blog about it and submit it. And we have student-produced blogs. So it really is a whole community in involved. And what we'd like to do is keep it going. Um, from Santa Barbara High School, we have the majority of the students, obviously, because we've been promoting it so much within our school. But our hope is tonight that we can get it to other schools in Santa Barbara so we can start the trend of going outwards from there and slowly just kind of have a ripple effect. And once we, once we get a certain number of people, it's going to become even more beneficial each night for every person using it. And That's so, yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah, thank Do you. you uh, how much does it cost you to run this? Well, you know, I want to thank my dad, first of all. Because, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to think I have a lot of interesting ideas, but there aren't too many that we could decide on which ones to pursue. And this one was mm. one we both felt could, you know, could work. So, um, are you going to go commercial? And well, in take a way, advertising. There, you know, um, I guess this uh, project has kind of woken me up to the real world in many ways. And uh, one of them is that nothing's free. <laughs> um, the co it costs money to to get this thing going, and so we put some non, you know, non-obtrusive ads on the sides, which um, I don't think you can see from here, but yeah. they. Um, they're kind of out of the way, but they help pay for our costs, which definitely were, um, you know, there was time involved, yeah. engineering involved. I'm not a programmer, so we had someone to do that. But the main idea is that it's going to be free for anyone who wants to get help on, edu you know, education-based yeah. topics. And um, I guess, I mean, I really don't know the costs at hand. I try to stay away. I'm, I'm the visionary in this, in this, yeah. <laughs> in this project. But, yes. um, and that's how I like it. So, well, so. I, I just, I, I. I'd like to put in a plug for you because we have we have an audience here and we have an audience uh, on television, and uh, th if if there's ever a, an example uh, of a project uh, which 
first of all, started outside the system, uh, a very creative project, showing that there are these creative resources if in education in the broader community. But here's a great one for some phil philanthropic group to get to behind and make some, uh, give them some support and get this institutionalized because Good. this sounds absolutely terrific. Well, thank you. And, and um, even if you're not willing to, you know, if, if it's not money, but if it's from just word of mouth, if it's from emailing everyone on your emailing list, I'm sure a lot of people here are very involved with the education community, not only here, but anywhere. And like I said, that's, if anything, we would just love you guys to, to help us out, support it, and tell all your friends, tell all your um, colleagues, anyone that can, you know, spread the word and keep it going. At Santa Barbara High School, um, I was able to, um, thanks to Mr. Turnbull, I know he's in somewhere. Um, I can't say enough. Thank you. One, I just want to say thanks so much. I and mean, this isn't an Oscar speech, but thank you because, <laughs> no, because that's why I'm here today. That's why we, we've had so much success is because people like Mr. Turnbull, there's so many teachers at Santa Barbara High School that have made it their mission to, to show that this can work. And because of them, it's actually useful for so many students from everywhere. And um, we, we described it to the Santa Barbara High faculty. And since then, we've had more teachers and students on just in the last couple of weeks. So it definitely is out there. And it's up to every one of us to see how far we can go. So I always tell people that you know, if I could tell a million students in a row, just each one telling about the site, they would all join it. But since I can't tell everyone, it's going to have to come from all of us to well, get it. When, when you get to the level of Google, don't forget us. I won't. <laughs> I won't. Yeah, that's far away, though. <laughs> so anyway, if there's any other questions, that's it. I mean, Two quick comments, yeah. Mike. Well, first of all, thank you to you and your colleagues. And I'm actually one of the 700,000 hits. <laughs> but uh, two comments. Number one, I really like the fact that it's a risk-free way to ask dumb questions. Yeah. Y it's hard to do that in a classroom right. sometimes yeah. and really much easier to do it yeah. in a more nameless, faceless kind of situation. Yeah. Number two, get rid of that procrastination so right, yeah. option. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for any of those, for those who don't know, it's um, the best way to play mini putt when you're not trying to study real quick. So you can uh, play a little bit of ping pong, mini putt. You know, we we figured we're all kids in the end of the day, so we might as well. You know, we can all get distracted for a little bit. So anyway, I know you guys are busy, so thank you very much. And uh, well, yeah. just. Just very quickly, uh, and I really appreciate the work that you've done. I, I was hoping that maybe we could, is, if your father is here, oh, yeah, if we could get him to stand and get the recognition that we, that he oh, definitely, yeah, definitely deserves. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we <laughs> <laughs> Not only do we appreciate the work that you've done that support our students, but also it's wonderful to, uh, to have a model of a parent who is so supportive of a student's uh, innovation and creativity, and I think your, your partners benefit from yeah, that as well. Absolutely. And I just want to say on, on behalf of the board, it is a joy to have this kind of a presentation at our board meetings. So don't, ap don't ever apologize for talking to us <laughs> about educational issues because we are usually dealing with numbers and things that are much more administrative. This is truly a joy, and thank you so much for being uh, here. Well, thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, we do have to move on in our agenda. <laughs> we, would, we would love to spend the rest of the evening having, having this discussion. Now, Mike Lewis, that's a name we may hear more of. Yes, I think so, and a few of these others as well. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Um, so we are now at the superintendent's report, another report from uh, Dr. Sarvis. Well, I do have other news to present tonight. We are in Parent Conference Week in our elementary district. 
And we have high school exit exams coming up. High school exit exam retesting for 10th and 11th graders will take place on November 7th and 8th. The board brief. Generally on the second and fourth Friday of each month, my office issues a report to the board called the board brief. This is a collection of reports and articles on school and district matters. A copy is on display in the reception area or can be provided through my office. At the last board meeting, I didn't have time to call your attention to one of the items presented by Jan Zettel, which was a memo that included a supplemental reading list for the secondary district on books written by authors of color and women. Project Upgrade Kickoff. Adams Elementary School recently hosted a Project Upgrade Kickoff. QAD, a local technology company, donated more than $32,000 for computer lab hardware upgrades and laptops for teachers. The vision and enthusiasm of Principal Matt Zuckowitz played an important part, an important role in the selection of Adams as the first site to benefit from these upgrades. QAD is interested in more of our schools. The upgrade will enable Adams students to develop and utilize word process, processing, spreadsheet, database, PowerPoint, and video editing skills. Project upgrade will target schools in need throughout Santa Barbara County. And we thank QAD for that. Civic Mission of Schools Forum. Tomorrow, Santa Barbara High School will host a Civic Mission of Schools Forum. The forum, which includes high school students from within our districts and from Kern County, will have a Sim City format. Students will receive a hypothetical school scenario and will include so that will include social problems surrounding violence, academic achievement issues, and cultural intolerance issues. The scenario in a facilitator guide was presented and was printed and emailed in advance. The students will come together tomorrow to create an action plan to define the issues, to identify challenge areas, and create an effective implementation strategy. The forum is intended to engage students as they learn about how to be involved in public policy planning, and I'm sure Mr. Turnbull will use the results of that to the school's benefit. The single plan for for student achievement. We will have a series of board presentations by schools on their single plans for school achievement. Harding, Franklin, McKinley, and Cleveland, excuse me, Cleveland and uh, Santa Barbara Community Academy will present their single plan for student achievement this Friday, beginning at noon, right here. Following on the next Friday will be Cesar Chavez, Adams, Monroe, Peabody, OAS, Roosevelt, and we will have follow-up meetings then for Washington and the junior highs on November 17th and the high school presentations on Tuesday, November 21st, which will begin at 5. Santa Barbara Public Education Foundation has undergone a name change. The Public Educa Education Foundation is now entitled Santa Barbara Education Foundation. So the Ed Foundation, uh, they've dropped the word public from their name and, uh, and we'll be giving you more information on the uh, foundation as uh, their plans for the, uh, the year progress. The, Education Foundation is an independent foundation from the school district. Franklin School has a wall of honor. Nominations are being accepted for Franklin Elementary School's wall of honor. Previous inductees include physician Sylvia Corral, football player Sam Cunningham, actor Anthony Edwards, youth activities leader Cliff Lambert, football coach Ernest Zampezi, architect Ken Kruger, there are a number of people in this community. Tom Parker was telling me just the other day that, uh, that he attended uh, Franklin Elementary School. Annette Cordero just told us she attended <laughs> Franklin Elementary School. Completed application forms must be turned into the school by November 9th. On the second floor, board members will see artwork. Please take a moment to view the clay African passport ma masks in the display case on the second floor of this building that were created by Peabody Charter School sixth graders. Across from that display on the second floor bulletin board are leaf poems for the fall created by Roosevelt sixth graders. And upcoming events, tomorrow is the second gate information night at Santa Barbara Junior High. 
Now, I have two different times written down for the start of that meeting. Mr. Zettel? Do you, six o'clock. Yes. Good, thank you. Uh, another event, there will... 6.30. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good, 6.30 tomorrow night at Santa Barbara Junior High, thank you. There will be a Kermes Festival at McKinley Elementary School on Saturday, beginning at noon. La Colina Junior High School's talent show will take place on November 2nd at 6.30. San Marcos will per perform Will, uh, Will Shakespeare's romance, The Winner's Tale, November 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Santa Barbara High School's theater department will hold their first performance of Still Life with Iris on November 10th. And Dos Pueblos High School's theater department will perform the musical Kiss Me Kate beginning November 10th. All in the busy lives of our schools. And that's tonight's report. Thank you, Dr. Sarvis. That was very thorough. Um, we certainly have a lot coming up. Okay, that brings us to item C8, correspondence. Do any board members have correspondence they wish to bring forward at this time? Okay, then that brings us to public comment. I believe we have 12 uh, individuals who have submitted speaker cards for public comment. Again, I want to remind you that this is the time at which um, individuals may speak on any topic that is within the jurisdiction of the board and is not on tonight's agenda. If you wish to speak to an item that is on tonight's agenda, then we would ask you to wait until that agenda item is taken and speak at that time. Okay, so we will call up the speakers. You will have three minutes. If you have not spoken um, at the board meeting bef before you note, I will let you know that um, when you begin to speak, there, was w there will be a green light on the podium at when your time expires, the light will turn red. I will also give you a 30 second heads up uh, about when you're about to run out of time, okay? Linda Mitchell followed by Mike Nunn. Good evening. How wonderful to follow a student who's a product of the teachers that are standing behind me. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Sarvet, my, Sarvis. My name is Linda Mitchell, and I'm representing the teachers that are standing behind me tonight. Uh, we have a representative from all the school sites which represent all of our certificated teachers. And I'm very happy they're here tonight, and especially our elementary who are having conferences this week. So this was a lot to, to come out tonight. Um, this community has demonstrated its support for publication, public, public education in pre-K to 12th grade. Santa Barbara residents depend on our schools and expect the best for them. That means providing an adequate salary and benefits to be able to retain a highly qualified faculty at our Santa Barbara schools. The Santa Barbara Board has lost sight of its responsibility for ensuring responsible management to make that happen. We want to focus on teaching students. That's what we're all about. Therefore, we have a resolution that states our intention to do what is necessary to support our bargaining team and find a resolution to our, re to our negotiations. The resolution states as follows. Whereas education does not happen without teachers, and whereas Santa Barbara teachers continue to provide students with an outstanding education, and whereas it's become clear that the fiscal priorities of the Santa Barbara School Board continue to keep the classroom at the bottom of the list, and whereas despite the board's published focus goal to recruit and retain highly qualified staff, there continues to be an exodus of new teachers from the Santa Barbara School District to teach elsewhere. And whereas state revenues are up and this year's school funding will be the highest in years, and whereas Santa Barbara teachers have fallen far behind in their ability to live where they work and be full partners in the community. Now therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Santa Barbara Teachers Association strongly support the C Santa Barbara Teachers Association bargaining team and its efforts to achieve a contract settlement now. Be it further resolved that Santa Barbara teachers will be active, willing participants in association activities that will move the district to a quick resolution to the current bargaining situation. And I have to give to you um, President Cordero, uh, signed resolutions from our teachers in Santa Barbara School District. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Mike Nunn, followed by Laura Baker. Yes, thank you. I began working at Lacombe Junior High in 1980. I've been there many years through ninth graders and middle school and everything. The proposed idea of possibly bringing the K through three to Lacumbra, I think, is not a wise idea for the K through three or for the junior high's future growth. I would like you to urge you to very, very carefully do your homework really carefully and find out how much it's going to cost and do it wisely. Lacumbra has been through so much turmoil in the time I've been there. Your predecessors have made, in my opinion, many, many mistakes. I'm asking you, please don't make a mistake. Do your homework carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nunn. Laura Baker, followed by Luther Lewis. Thank you very much. Of course, I'm here to speak about the Academy move as well. Um, I'd like the board to communicate with the Lacumbra community what the timeline is for this proposal. We're basically in the dark on the timeline, if there even is one. Um, we hear that Pat Saley talking about phasing in grade levels. We've heard other people say nothing's happening until 2008. We hear the academy parents saying the board promised us two years of, of being split. That's coming up. We, we're going to be at Lacumbra in full in 2007. In July of 2007, we start the school year. Which is it? We don't know, and it's frustrating not knowing. It creates rumors. It creates problems. Um, when is the facilities master plan update supposed to come back to the board? Do we even know that? The other thing I'd like to do is, um, I'm just going to throw out a, a, something that came to my mind the other day, and I don't know that this is something that could actually happen or not. I'm just going to throw it out there. The academies needs to be housed in one place. La Cuesta needs to be housed in one place. We have issues not with the academy. We have issues with an elementary school program being placed on the secondary site. Okay, you've got declining enrollment in elementary. You've got La Cuesta is overburdening sites that are already overcrowded. Why not take the elementary school program, put it on an elementary site where there's severe declining enrollment, move the four through six, which is only 120 kids, to an elementary school. Later, you can phase in the K through three. Take La Cuesta, put them in the space where La Cumbra has the academy right now. It's a secondary site. Basically, I think that's no cost to the district to move an elementary program to an elementary site, secondary program to a secondary site. It solves your problem of where you're going to put La Cuesta. It also opens up the academy area right here at K through Theodore Ortega for the nurses, Healthy Start, all of those things that are going to be bumped out of La Cumbra when you take our portables out. I'm just, I'm just, things just start coming to me in the middle of the night when I'm thinking about all of this. So I, that's just something to think about. The other issue is, <clears throat> I really feel that this is not in the conceptual stage any longer. The meeting that we had at Lacumbre the other day was, you know, top heavy basically. I mean, we had Dr. Sarvis and Pat Saley and David Hetyonk and Dan Zettel and Joe Wilcox, the architect, and Carl Mayrose, the secondary project manager. I, I'm sorry, if it's in conceptual stage, do you really pay all those people to come and sit in a meeting for two hours to talk about something that's conceptual? This doesn't make sense to me that we're still in the conceptual stage. I was very disappointed to hear that one of the board members sat down with a teacher and a parent after hearing from 25 people at the last board meeting talking about their issues about La Cumbra and sat down and said, this is going to happen. This is a budget issue. Have you been, to, have you been hired to be making decisions only on budget? I understand budget is something you need to decide, that you need to take into account. But I was under the impression, I've always have been under the impression, that the board is here to make educational decisions for the youth of our, of our community, not budget-driven decisions. They should be student-driven decisions. And I understand that it is one part of your decision-making process. But I don't think it should be, thank you, I see it. I don't think that it should be your only decision. And, and, and I, that really concerns me. And I wonder if that's a violation of the Brown Act or the spirit of the Brown Act. If you've already made that decision in your mind, hey, I think you ought to need to step down. Recuse yourself from this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. <laughs> Luther Lewis, followed by Aaron Solis. Hi. I am Luther Lewis. I live on the west side of Mount Mountain Avenue. I've resided there for 43 years. Very familiar with Lacumbre Junior High School. Uh, 
at the last meeting we had very limited time and first of all I would like to have a letter uh, entered into the Board of Education it reads as follows from the Westside Neighborhood Watch Committee we are requesting a formal traffic study to be conducted and determine the impact of proposed move from the Community Academy, Academy grades at K through three to Lacumber Junior High School. We request that it be conducted by a certified traffic engineer. We're also advised that Pele Clifford of the City of Santa Barbara would also be available to assist. Now, will you please advise us further on what you plan on doing? And to go a step further, I was notified, as I told you last time, I, I figured out about 80 parking spaces around Lacumber Junior High School if you parked in the red zone. I was advised by uh, Santa Barbara Police Department traffic, Mr. Fledgling, Sergeant Fledgling, that red zones is a no-no. And so that cuts your 30 parking spaces down, period. But what does that leave you? With 300 cars trying to come in and out, dropping off students and picking up students. One other thing you have to look at, Portswello, Bel Air, Knowles, where I live, what if I have a heart attack on Mountain Avenue at 315? How am I going to get a fire truck? He's on, Lopa, on Modoc Road. He can't get up Portswello Drive because of the traffic at the school. You've got to go down Las Positas, come up the backside of Portswello to get to my house, to get to San Andres Street or anyone in that area of the, of the, road, of the, the city. And this is, this is not in our best interest. And I think you should have the, the fire marshal take a look at this, along with the traffic engineer. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Aaron Solis, followed by Kenneth Locke. Good evening. Um, as a representative of the San Marcos faculty, I'm speaking to you tonight regarding the student sit-in held at San Marcos High School on Friday, October the 13th. We have been disappointed with the um, reported quotes in the media regarding the event and knowing the media can represent events in a less than accurate light at times. We wanted the board and the district to be aware of what occurred. Teachers were surprised that the sit-in happened as we did not know ahead of time that it was going to take place. Students had walked around in between uh, class time between periods three and four to let others know that what was going to occur. At the start of fourth periods, teachers began their classes and let the students know they were going to continue teaching. Obviously, some students chose to skip class and attend the sit-in. Others attended the sit-in even though they were done with their school day. The student leaders were very conscious that this was a serious protest and students were not there just to skip class. This was evident in the fact that the students did not leave until 4 p.m. when the office was closed on homecoming weekend. In our social studies classes, we teach students that history honors those who stand up for what they believe and that peaceful protest often makes the loudest statements. However, we also teach that when one protests, there are consequences. If one believes strongly enough, the penalty is worth it. Obviously, these students felt the penalties of be giving cuts, loss of points in class, and suspension from ASB activities was worth it. The students involved in the planning of the sit-in are passionate about the teacher salary negotiations. The students, not the teachers, planned this event, nor were they pushed nor, or persuaded to plan it. Many students out at school have parents who are teachers in our district, both at the elementary and secondary levels, and the issue of teacher salary negotiation directly affects them and their families. In addition, students have experienced the loss of beloved teachers who have either left the area or the profession itself due to cost concerns. We don't know if KYT quoted the, the district correctly in their portrayal of the events, but to suggest that students are not capable of organizing a peaceful protest on their own is neither truthful nor fair. 
The students at San Marcos and at other schools had district support in their protests of immigrant rights earlier this year. Obviously, the students learned from that experience and wanted to make a statement regarding the issue of teacher salaries. It is also not acceptable to insinuate that our teachers are not professional and we would like an apology. At San Marcos, we are a real community that cares about our members, whether they are students, teachers, staff, administration, or parents. When something happens to one set of stakeholders, we feel we are all affected. This is seconds. what makes our school so special. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Solis. <laughs> Kenneth Locke, followed by Alice Tarbush. My name is Kenneth Locke. Uh, I'm speaking before you once again. I spoke before the city council today, did a public comment. Uh, I shared a page with, which I shared with, uh, I think you might have received uh, prior to this meeting. Uh, the website, uh, the page, it's called the, the Genius of All Masters Degrees. Uh, what I've been um, communicating with the city uh, about is, uh, and I referred to it with you guys also, is the nature of the next age, uh, shift of paradigms. And uh, uh, what I'm making people aware of is uh, the, the nature of the master's degree uh, in relation to the next paradigm. Um, in relation to this next age, what's going to happen is actually all the, the master's degrees that have been handed out uh, are going to be understood as nullified. Um, and even the teachers, uh, professors, uh, education all across the board, we're going to understand uh, them as all students and uh, starting over from uh, a square one. Uh, this is the basis of a renewal, educational renewal. Um, I'm explaining the basis of uh, me being a double master, and with that understanding, it, it will provide the, the understanding of an educational standard and of what a master is in relation to all disciplines, uh, interdisciplinary. Um, this is not going on right now. We're, this, this educational age that we're in right now is understood as a dark age, non-integrated. Um, the fine arts, the MFAs, uh, in relation to that degree, um, I'm here to say that uh, there has not been a true master by my standard uh, in, in relation to history. And uh, what I represent as an individual is come in due season and uh, here to uh, uh, host uh, this age um, based on the fact that, uh, that uh, I have this knowledge to, to share as a, like a messenger. And then also in relation to athletics, um, in relation to uh, a mind-body integration. And I also explained that mind-body integration in relation to the exercise of painting. To understand the history of art uh, through the abstract, um, it, it requires that understanding to understand where I fall in the, in the line. Um, I'll, I have- uh, 30 seconds. Okay. You have my website address, my email. Uh, I'll be. I'm, I'll be leaving town for a little bit, and uh, I should be back sometime, maybe in this, sometime this winter and in the summer type of thing, if there's any questions. Um, but uh, right now, uh, in, a, in one of the uh, news magazines, there was a story called uh, Science and the Soul. And I'm sorry to say that the information they're sharing is relatively incomplete. Uh, again, I represent a messenger or a source of that knowledge in relation to an art-science integration, as well as the mind-body-spirit-soul integration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Alice Torbush, followed by Joe Atwell. Good evening, members of the board, attendees at the meeting. Uh, I spoke earlier on the subject of the uniting the um, academy and Lacumber Junior High School, and I'd like to continue this slightly tonight. You know, I think we have to consider the purpose of schools in general to provide a good academic character building and safe educational opportunity for students of all ages. The academy and the junior high at the Lacumber uh, campus have faculties and programs which really are fostering the basic good goals and responsibilities which will benefit all the diverse students in these two populations. They worked out of a genuine system of cooperation. They are including the younger children in some of the performances. 
There are many things being done to assimilate the group in a positive manner. Uh, however, uh, it also, I observed that the teachers work and plan and build indiv individual needs and build school spirit and the cooperative approaches as I mentioned are very, very important. In past practice, there have been a variety of methods for dividing groups of students. The earlier K-8 lasted for a long time and that was, that followed the on graded schools and single uh, room schools. And the trouble with the K-8 as we became more industrialized and all like that, it gave less opportunities for the students in the upper grades to have a choice and develop individual talents and interests which thrive in a basically departmentalized environment. In many localities, the K-2 or K-3 still persist and work well without the challenges of older students on campus. Uh, middle school also served a valid function. The major problem with diverse plans seems to be in the basic premise by which they're formed. If the premise is just student room ratio or money constraints which bring about uh, hasty action and then leisurely uh, regret, they do not address the true purpose of our schools. And I think whatever is chosen or whatever is decided, the children and the program that is best for them and the safety and their good spirit should be paramount in all decisions. I appreciate the SBCA's wish to become a reunite, but Many logistical problems remain <clears throat> and need time to be uh, de decided upon. 30 seconds. Okay. I feel that time can be used to test the junior high school growth, which it is growing, and the true availability of, of space and meeting the challenge of eventually finding a truly successful reuniting at the, academic, uh, the academy at an elementary site. And I do appreciate your attention and I feel very strongly that this problem can be solved amicably for everyone concerned and economically. Thank you, Ms. Starbush. <laughs> Joe Atwell, followed by Eva Imbar. Is, is Mr. Atwell, Atwell here? Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. I guess not. No, no. Oh, so uh, go ahead, Eva. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Uh, good evening, members of the board and members of the audience. I have a very brief um, announcement about Measure D. That is the, no, the measure that will be on the November ballot to improve transportation in Santa Barbara County. Now, what does that have to do with schools? I'll tell you, it has a lot to do with schools. It contains a dedicated fund for Safe Foods to School programs that will make the route to school much safer and make a huge difference for bringing kids to and from school, uh, school safely. So I'm asking all of you to have a good look at this measure and to support it in November and please tell all your friends. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Inbar. Martha Salas followed by Roseanne Crawford. Good evening, board members, Dr. Sarvis. I am here today to speak to you regarding the programs that Dr. Bob Noel has proposed or soon will be. When I first read about the academies in the paper, my immediate reaction was gratitude. Everyone on this board has different talents, and I applaud all of you for your hard work. You could all be home right now. However, instead, you choose to be here, and I appreciate that. I have had the privilege of knowing Dr. Bob Noel for several years now. I remember the first meeting we had to discuss what else, education. Now in hindsight, I am not surprised that he greeted me with an educational program he had recently written and that he asked me for my opinion and helped translating it into Spanish. Since then, he has never ceased to amaze me his consistency and focus has always been in making sure that nothing stands in the way of bringing the best education possible to all students, from those that are struggling to those that will always do well, leaving no one out of the equation. Santa Barbara is fortunate to have Dr. Noel on this board. First of all, he is a man whose character is beyond reproach. 
Secondly, his talent for research and ability to dissect and discuss complex issue, issues and the willingness to speak up even if it is uncomfortable are qualities that I look for in a board member. The courage that he has exemplified since he took office serves as an example to us all. Dr. Noel, I am ready to volunteer, as are all my friends, in making sure that the academies that you are proposing become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Ms. Salas. Rosa, um, I'm sorry, before we continue, since it hasn't traditionally been the case that people have done, uh, you know, uh, endorsements for candidates at public comment, um, I do think we to introduce the other candidates who are in the room. Um, Ms. Cr uh, Crawford is, is one of them. Uh, Kate Parker and Susie Cawthon are also running for school board, as is Dr. Noel. Thank you. The wonderful Let's Cram presentation tonight draws attention to our technologically dependent society. Again, my name is Roseanne Crawford. I am running for Santa Barbara School Board. When I was going door to door introducing myself in one of our neighborhoods, I spoke with a Mr. Bob Faulkner, an open alternative parent. He reported that the school has a lot of very old iMac original computers. In visiting different schools and speaking with numerous parents and principals, I have observed a need to do a better job of providing consistency, not only in the academic area, but in our school's direct needs as well. I'm sure Mr. Faulkner, as well as the OAS parents and the body of the school would appreciate some newer computers before the end of the year. If this is not possible, when elected, I will have a business donate computers to the school. This is the least that we can do for a school instrumental in raising the I-98 funds and never got a school. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. Last, we have Claire. I'm sorry if I'm going to mispronounce your last name. Is it Jerova? I okay. I apologize. Uh, I actually had something prepared. This was sort of short notice, so the group voted me into speaking, uh, <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, uh, we don't mind at all, but could you state your name, please? Yeah, I was going to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, members of the board, good evening. I'm Zach King from San Marcos High School. Um, of course, you realize that we recently had a sit-in involving approximately 200 students in the San Marcos High School office after third period and during fourth period and going until 4 p.m. on Friday the 13th. Uh, this was in support of the teacher's much needed raise of course, as students, we understand what's going on. We don't just take actions like this for nothing, right? We understand that our education is important. We don't skip class for no reason. We, uh, in fact, made it clear to the students that were participating that if anyone was going to participate just to skip class, they should leave. They should go to class right now. We didn't want them to be a part of this. Only people that understood, that actually cared, and were passionate about the teachers getting this raise should participate. It was reported in the press that certain board members suspected that the teachers were behind the sit-in, and uh, we apologize for this misunderstanding. We feel that uh, someone assumed that we weren't capable of intelligent political action. Well, uh, to further clarify, we are capable. We understand the issue at hand, we realize that the teachers deserve a raise, and we realize that action needs to be taken. The teachers are not responsible. We took this action because we wanted to show our support and our willingness to do what it takes to get results. Thank you for taking the time to let us explain. Thank you, Mr. King and fellow students. Okay, that concludes public comment. We will now move on to our consent agenda. Our 
Are there any items that board members wish to pull? Yes. Um, D2 and, I'm sorry, D3 and D4. So D not D2. Not D2. D3 not D2. And D3 okay. and D4. D11? Uh, and D11, yeah. Okay, D3, 4, 5, 6, uh -oh. and 11. Kay. And 13. I'm sorry. Ouch. Okay. I trust that covers them all. <laughs> well, you're uh, second vote for 11. Okay. Well, I think it's the third. Um, okay, so we have D1, no. 2. No. No, 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 listen, please. Oh. We have D1, okay. 2, oh. 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12 left. So can we take um, a to motion to approve those? Move to approve the remaining items. Second. Okay. I pulled, thir I pulled 13. All those in yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries 5-0. Um, and again, for any, any members of the public who might be interested in addressing any of these items, we will take these at the end of the agenda this evening. Who Madam Chair, that? most of the items, oh, okay. ex with the exception of item 11, most of them are very quick clarifications. I don't know if you want to wait until the end of the evening or not. Well, unfortunately, our quick clarifications Quick clarifications often okay, snowball into fine. lengthier discussion, okay. so I'm going to have us come back to those. Okay. Um, okay. Madam President, and if, if I could, I'm not, uh, pardon me for interrupting, but to clear up any potential confusion, I'm not sure that the approval motion covered. Yes, I agree. I just was going to say that too. I realized that when I read them, I only read up to the 13. end of the page. And it should have included the next page. Move but the motion move. said the remaining items. So I think it would. I'm happy to cover my bases and move okay. to approve items D14 through 23. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. All of them are now covered. Thank you for catching us. Okay. Action. That brings us to the action agenda. Item E1, the approval of McKinley and Cesar Chavez Charter Schools decision not to participate in the California Department of Education High Priority Schools Grant Program. Um, and Assistant Superintendent Robin Sawaski will be presenting this to the board tonight. Okay. Um, this is just in here as a discussion item simply because that's what the California Department of Education requires. Um, we need to submit the minutes of the meeting to say that, that this was discussed. I believe it was a couple weeks ago. It was a full packet was in the board brief explaining the reasons behind the um, denial or non-acceptance of the letter to participate. Um, basically, it seemed to us for the small amount of money that we would receive for the planning grant that the degree to which the school was going to have to jump through hoops with lots of reports, lots of issues around accountability that weren't going to really move the school f forward, um, we, we looked into it. We called CDE and did a lot of research before we declined this. So we just uh, needed on record that we talked about it. And I'll answer any questions or confusion as far as any reason for this. Well, and let me clarify, it's on for approval tonight. Madam Chair, yes. I just have one quick question. Um, yes, Ms. Arter. So applying and not even necessarily getting any funds still would subject those two schools to possible additional sanctions. The application is an automatic. You get a $50,000. Okay. Just, it's a planning grant. Okay. But unlike the first invitation in the spring that we denied originally, this one put forth a, a immediate accountability. And it's not that we're afraid of accountability at any, for any reason. I mean, we're in this already. Um, it just seemed that the kinds of plans that we had to put forward in addition to our single plan, in addition to the work that we're already doing, these, these schools just said, you know, it's not worth it. It's not going to get us any further in our work with increasing the student achievement. So that was, yeah, that was the deal. Can I ask a question about sure. that? They wouldn't accept the other things that we are already doing in lieu of something new? Mm -hmm. They accept all of that, plus they have all kinds of additional pieces that had to be done. Interesting. So it's yeah. not in lieu of, it's in addition to? In addition to. Okay. 
Okay, so this is on for approval. So move to approve. Okay. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries 5 0. That brings us to item E2 approval of public disclosure of collective bargaining agreement for the California School Employees Association for 2006 2007. And Dr. Robertson will present this. This was on for discussion at our last board meeting, and it's being brought back to you tonight for your approval. Dr. Robertson? I'm going to do my Dr. Robertson impression and <laughs> my and best Bob attempt Wolf. at that. Um, this is a, the standard form in, in this particular attachment. This is the standard form that's required by the County Office of Education to identify the cost and the impact of the settlement agreement. And so, they, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It should have sort of been together as one item, uh, but somehow or another got separated. Well, You're saying this should have been together with E3, you mean? Yes, ma'am, that's okay. correct. Well, okay. It's essentially the same thing. One is just the financial document. The other one is the verbal Very document. Good. Right. Very good. Right. Okay, so what we need to do is, if, well, do we have any questions about E2? Okay, then we need to entertain a motion to approve. Uh, move to approve the public disclosure of the collective bargaining agreement for California School Employees Association for 0607. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. Okay, so that brings us to item E3, which is the language for the agreement. Thank you. Uh, on October 5th, the district and CSCA reached tentative agreement on a collective bargaining uh, agreement for the period of July 1st, 2006 through June 30th of 2006. On October 18, CSCA met with their members uh, to ratify this agreement, and we brought it uh, back to you tonight for your approval of this agreement. I'd like to briefly review uh, what we have uh, agreed to with CSEA, and that is effective September 1st, health and welfare benefits contribution caps as listed in the attached tentative agreement or uh, in the budget uh, information that was provided. The 2005-2006 classified salary will remain in effect uh, unless, uh, except if there is an adjustment above the 1.5% that was provided to health, welfare, and benefits. There's new language on the following articles. Uh, Article 3, organizational rights and obligations. Article 7, which is leaves. And Article 11, which is uh, evaluations. We have a brand new evaluation form for classified. An agreement that the district will not lay off positions or reduce hours in the classified bargaining unit uh, for 2006-2007 to fund this agreement. And reclassification procedures, which uh, we piloted uh, new procedures pretty much for the first time this year, and we're agreeing to meet and continue to negotiate some modifications to that procedure. Uh, I'd like to recommend that the board um, approve and take action on this agreement tonight. Move to approve. Approval of public disclosure of collective bargaining agreement for the California School Employees Association. Oh, I read the wrong one. <laughs> and Santa Barbara School Districts for the 2006-2007 school year. Wait, we're, we need to move to approve the tentative, tentative agreement. agreement. Thank you. Okay. I was reading E2. I'm sorry. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion carries 5-0. Um, that brings us to item E4, appointment of community to fill vacant position on Measure V Bond Oversight Committee. And this has been discussed before. Now, we do have an opening on the Bond Oversight Committee, and Dave Hetyunk will make this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sarvis, board members. A few meetings ago, uh, we had this item on the agenda, and the board uh, directed myself to uh, let everybody know that there was a vacancy so anybody else that uh, wanted to be considered for the position could. We've beat the bushes, so to say. Uh, we've emailed all the secondary principals so they can let their staffs know and their parent groups and their PTAs know. We've gone to the Bond Oversight Committee and let everybody know with the Bond Oversight Committee. And we have two people that are interested in this position. Both of them are uh, listed in the attachment, uh, my memorandum dated October 19th. 
Uh, the board may choose one of these two people. The board may choose another person of their choice, or the board may take no action. It's purely at your discretion. Do we have either of them here tonight? No, I don't believe we do. Okay. I board will, members, what are your what is your pleasure? I will dive into the discussion. Okay. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is hard, really. Well, um, at the not at the last board meeting, at the board meeting before when this item was on, um, it was suggested that Dos Pueblos had a heavy presence on the Bond Oversight Committee. And I assume that that included my presence on the Bond Committee as a former Dos Pueblos parent. So just to satisfy myself, I went back to look at membership lists, and I'm happy to report that the chairmanship uh, to the committee has wrote, been rotated equally between representatives from each of the three high schools. Um, I, would, I think it's uh, safe to say that that's been a fairly equitable division. Um, with regard to members at large, uh, I would say it's actually leaned away from DP um, and probably uh, a little bit more heavily toward Santa Barbara High School if I was to choose one of the three of the seven schools in, involved with representation on the committee. Now the at-large members bring a certain expertise, but they also happened to have uh, children uh, enrolled in, uh, in, uh, in our schools. Um, the two uh, people who are in front of us now uh, are uh, being considered for at-large membership, and the bylaws uh, uh, request that they have an expertise in the area of architecture, engineering, construction, finance, real estate development, that sort of thing. I think that both of the uh, members suggested, uh, or potential members, Jenny Kuga and, and John Nelson, uh, are both uh, very committed parents, although Ms. Kuga is now a former parent. Um, but uh, I would be happy to forward John Nelson's name. You can read his little uh, biography here. Um, and uh, with absolutely no insult to Ms. Kuga, she's provided great service to the Bond Oversight Committee for a number of years. Um, I guess I would like to suggest that uh, San Marcos is entering, uh, has the potential to enter into the greatest number of projects at this point in time. DP is already involved in several large projects. Um, San Marcos hopes to embark on a number of several large projects. So if we are going to weight the committee in a particular direction based on where someone's child has <coughs> attended or did attend the school, I would like to recommend Mr. Nelson. Is that a motion? Yes. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hetyunk. Okay, that brings us to item E5 um, Board Action on Student Expulsion, case numbers 0607 04, 0607 06, and 0607 09. Okay, I'll start. In the case 0607-04, move to uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking for my, my. Who said second first? Oh, <laughs> I can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Okay. In, I'd, um, oh, I'm sorry. We'll entertain the next motion. Uh, in the case of 0607-06, uh, move to uphold uh, the expulsion recommendation for the current semester uh, and to allow the student reentry to a comprehensive high school uh, but not the home high school in second semester or to investigate other educational options outside of our district. Second. Okay, this is 06? Yes. Okay. Second. 
we've been moved and seconded. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, motion carries 4 1. In the case 0607 09, move to uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel, which includes a peti uh, the ability for the student to petition for early readmission in January of 07 to return to their home high school. That, no. Is there a second? Okay. Um, I, it, for discussion, I just want to uh, point out that I, I'm uh, going to agree with this motion. I dis I disagreed with the last one because I think it. I would have preferred that the last motion treat the student the same way as this motion is treating this student. So, all those in favor, say aye. 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 And I'm going to vote no. Okay. So it's uh, four, one. Um, motion carries. Okay, that brings us to the end of our action agenda. It brings us to our conference agenda. Item F1, report on the Santa Barbara School District's child development programs. Well, we start tonight with an item that we postponed from our last agenda. I think it was about 11 o'clock and we they finally agreed that uh, they would rather go home than present at one. <laughs> <laughs> so strange as that sounds. With us tonight, we well, uh, Robin Sawaski. Th these are your programs. Would you like to introduce our presenters tonight? Certainly, I'm proud to introduce Susan Ashlock and Jenny Martinez, our two coordinators of our child development program. And I'm not going to say anything more because they have an, a packed presentation for you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Sarvis, members of the board, administration, and the general public. Um, we're here this evening to give you an overview of the child development program. And it's amazing to think that 72 years ago it started at the corner of Bath and Haley with 10 children at Las Flores. Today, we're serving over 1,100 children, and it's it's just amazing to think that we've come this far. And um, at this time, I'll turn it over to Jenny Martinez. Is this working? Oh, yeah, it is. Well, first, I have to tell you that I have not seen Susan all day. And even so, we've ended up color coordinating. As all. As, as we normally, yeah. We Great minds think alike. That's what yeah. I say. That's what Primary I say. Primary colors, just, too. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. But um, our desks, uh, we've been in the same office for 10 years. Ten, and ten years. And we just now are thinking alike. Yes. Okay, so as Susan said, we're here to give you an overview of our child development program. And we're going to try to go through quickly because there is a lot of information. But if you have questions, then we can hopefully answer those at the end. Uh, the Santa Barbara School District Child Development Program consists umbrellas a number of contracts. And they are the CalSAFE program, which stands for you know, and excuse the, us, but when we put this together, it came up much slower, and I don't know why it's coming up so fast, but it's not because we're trying to run through this. The CalSAFE program, which stands for California School Age Families Education Program, our Children's Centers program, which are full day preschools, our state preschool program, which is um, three hour sessions, 10 months, our school age programs, the HIPPY program, which stands for Home Instruction for Parents of Preschool Youngsters. And we're going to give you a little bit of information about some outs uh, uh, programs outside of our umbrella, but that are located on our district campuses. So let's see what happens now. We're located on most of the elementary school sites here in our district. We're also located, uh, see, it's just running through it. We're <laughs> located on the San Marcos High School campus, uh, which houses um, our CalSAFE program. And then the Santa Barbara High School campus, which also has a CalSAFE program, as well as the um, Santa Barbara High School Early Years Toddler program. We have um, satellite sites, Parma Children's Centers, and the newly accredited Las Flores site. We have our uh, business office on the campus of the Santa Barbara Junior High School. We serve over 1,100 families, as Susan mentioned, and we have 111 staff positions. About half of them are part-time. 
Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the CalSAFE program. We have two centers, again, one at San Marcos and one at Santa Barbara High School. Uh, they're funded through the state of California. And the main goal of the program is to offer resources and services to teen parents uh, to support them in getting their diploma. We're very proud to say that we have a 95% success rate, which we think is pretty good. One of the um, services that we offer is infant and toddler care. And we use the West Ed curriculum model, which is a philosophy of taking care of children. Our ratios are one adult for three uh, children. Uh, the teens are uh, required to attend a prenatal or a parenting life skills class, and that's taught by a credentialed teacher. Uh, and we also um, use the state-mandated desired results evaluation system, and Susan's going to talk about that in just a minute, because all of our state contracts are um, using the state-mandated desired results evaluation system. I'd like for you to take a close look at some of our student, our teen parents, and including a dad here in this picture. And uh, we're, it's such a delightful place to, to visit. You, if you ever have time, you need to go over to one of our CalSAFE centers. Susan's going to talk about the Children's Center program. Children's Centers. We have four children's centers. They're year-round. They're full day. Two of our largest centers are off Milpas. There's Parma Children's Center, Franklin Children's Center. They both have 64 families. We have a toddler center on the Anapumu side of the Santa Barbara High School, and that serves 30 uh, two- to three-year-olds. Our newest children's center is Las Flores, which is kind of ironic, but we have one new classroom there that we were able to open with expansion funds from the state last April. Our primary goal is school readiness and 11 classrooms, 174 children. Um, they're all subsidized spaces and they're all funded by State of California child development contracts. On with children's centers, here you can see one of the activities that, hmm, that we have every May, uh, the dances. Um, here we have uh, meal time at Parma Children's Center. The curriculum models this year, we have open court pre-K pilot in five of our classrooms. Um, we're starting the expansion of the Waterford Early Reading Program in our children's centers for the pre-Ks. We just started this year a full day training for certification in the No Place for Hate through the um, ADL and we'll be continuing on with future trainings for our certification. We use the scholastic model in some classrooms, literature based. Uh, we have the fundamentals of the high school philosophy in almost every classroom. Those fundamentals are focus on active learning, the centers are um, set up, the classrooms are set up into centers, uh, daily routine is uh, part of the high school philosophy, large group, small group, outside time. Uh, we have collaborations with the Healthy Start School District and with the county health linkages. The collaborations bring family advocates full time year round to uh, bridge to community services for our families. The collaboration with Healthy Start also brings workshops for our families, some site based, some region based um, on topics such as that parents suggest, discipline, nutrition. Um, they change every year. Uh, reading with your child is a, a favorite um, evening presentation. Uh, Health Linkages Collaboration provides dental care for all of our children. This year, all children are dry brushing in our classrooms, and we have uh, dental examinations coming. Uh, local dentists volunteer their time. They come in the classrooms. They do the examinations and the referrals, and we have treatment dollars. Our assessment is uh, the rainbow for our four-year-olds, that's our English language assessment. And we have the mandated California Desired Results Evaluation System. This um, evaluation system is required in all of our contracts. So CalSAFE, school age programs, children's centers, state preschool, they all use the same components. So I'll explain them once and then you'll know that they're in all of the 
contracts. Desired results evaluation system. A developmental profile for each child completed twice a year, a summary for the parent, parent conference, and then the teacher will have all of her uh, developmental profiles summarized for classroom findings, and then they set action plans. Um, also, our teachers are required to post weekly lesson plans that must be aligned with the desired results outcomes and <clears throat> excuse me and they must also show in individualization of instruction for the children uh, we have also the parent survey that is given out at the first conference period that is also summarized and the teacher will set an action plan based on the findings the third part of the desired results mandated state results, I mean state system, is the environmental rating scales. Uh, the, the teaching team evaluates the quality in their classroom on um, a scale of one to seven in all different areas. And, and any area below a five requires an action plan. And all of these action plans and data then are summarized on our level and then we set action plans for the state. So it all goes back to the, to the state consultants for review. Uh, plans for expansion. Yes, um, the, the goal is to create more full day programs. Uh, the state preschool program, we have 15 state preschool classrooms located uh, throughout the district. Uh, they're all funded through the state, uh, d uh, the California uh, Department of Education. They're uh, three-hour sessions, and we serve children 181 days. Our four universal preschool classrooms are located at McKinley, and they're funded through the Santa Barbara County First Five. Uh, this year, for the very first time, we have the partnership with the Community Action Commission Head Start, and uh, we, are, we have enrolled 10 children uh, through in our program, so we get uh, funding through them. We have an anonymous donor, and of course, our child development contracts are also contributing. Uh, this year, we're full, or we were full two weeks ago, we were full, and we have since lost four uh, PFA children, or universal preschool children, and that's because I feel like, um, I know it's because our parents are having such trouble getting their children to our sites for the three hours and then picking them up. So this is a real symptom of the need in our community for full daycare, or for more hours of daycare. Uh, as Susan described, we have the same curriculum models. We have the same assessment uh, tools. We use the same assessment tools. We have the same collaboration uh, partnership with Healthy Start and Health Linkages. And our primary goal is school readiness. School age programs. We have 15 classrooms throughout the elementary district. And these classrooms are open full day when the elementary is closed, regular day they're open after school. They're funded f with child development contracts. They uh, also follow the um, mandated evaluation system. And they are funded in three, they have three different funding streams, which is different than our other contracts. We have just straight parent fee programs. We have uh, latchkey contracts, we have general child care contracts. So we have three funding streams. Uh, staff qualifications, the majority of our school age teachers hold multiple subject credentials. If you visit any classroom, you'll see the same components in the daily routine. They have homework time, they have enrichment time, they have outside time, they have large group. Uh, and so those components may be turned around a little bit, but you'll see them in all of our classrooms. Our school age classrooms are primarily shared with the state preschool in the morning and then school age in the afternoon. And then state preschool's not open in the summer. We run a summer program. The summer program um, looks like summer school in the morning, academic, afternoons enrichment. The enrichment may vary according to the curriculum that the teacher has chosen to study for the summer. Uh, but there will be some um, enrichment that's in place for all of the classrooms. 
There'll be field trips. There's a rec swim at Los Banos. We have consultants come in, art consultants, music, drama. Um, this last summer, the County Bowl sponsored Cameron Tummel to do, he's a drum circle facilitator and he worked with our classrooms. Okay, home instruction for parents of preschool youngsters, Hippie. Um, Hippie is an international program and it was brought to uh, the states by Hillary Clinton. She thought it would be a really good fit for her state of Arkansas, kind of a rural area in her rural areas. Uh, we started out with 45 families enrolled and we are now serving 120 families. Hippie is a 30-week, very scripted curriculum. Paraprofessionals take the weekly packet, role play it with the parent. They're not, de they're not teaching children, they're teaching parents. And then the parent works with their child 15 to 20 minutes a day. Uh, then the next week, the paraprofessional goes back, brings a new packet, picks up the old packet, any questions, any concerns, how can we help you? Uh, there's also monthly parent meetings with required attendance, and we have a coordinator that makes sure that those parents are there. Uh, we have a 98% um, uh, uh, completion rate, so we're really proud of that, that all of those families are actually making the commitment to this program uh, to finish the 30 weeks of curriculum. Waterford Early Reading Program is offered, and in fact, Hippie was the program that first brought Waterford to our district. We purchased, about four years ago, we purchased four standalones and located them at uh, four different, or three different elementary school sites, and then parents could schedule themselves into the classrooms to uh, have their child work on Hippie. So that's been a really um, great thing for Hippie, and we are now finally getting some data back, and we're going to be really happy to share that with Robin and Brian and Jan and whoever else wants information. And we'll send that on to the board in the board yeah, brief. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, the evaluation tools used are the Brigants, uh, the Rainbow, and the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. They're funded by the state of California First Five, the School Readiness Grant. Our child development programs support um, Hippie, and we have um, a number of private donations. Okay, the San Marcos Parent-Child Workshop. That is not actually under the umbrella of the Child Development Program, but we wanted to give you some information uh, about this program because it is on the San Marcos um, High School campus. Uh, it's been there, as you can see, uh, since 1959, and it is uh, totally, uh, funded by the, uh, the Santa Barbara City College um, Adult Ed. The parents volunteer, they work one morning a week, they come to a class one evening a week. And what's unique about the San Marcos uh, Parent-Child Workshop as compared to the other three Parent-Child Workshops, which are the Oaks by Oak Park, Star King, Upper Santa Barbara Street, and the Lou Grant uh, Center in Carpinteria, is that this center has a collaboration with the high school child development class that is taught throughout the year and students while they are taking the class are able to go and visit the center, work in some of the areas, take notes, do observations, come back to class and discuss the development of children and the center. Uh, we thought we would finish tonight and close with some of our reflections about each of our programs and uh, what we're doing as goal setting for this coming year, the year that we're actually in. Uh, CalSafe, there is a real need for newer and updated facilities. So we're looking for grants and um, making slow progress. Uh, we need more support services for CalSafe. In the last few years, there's been declining funding of certain agencies that were providing counseling, and other services that our teen parents really need. And we are on the search for services for our teen parents. Oh, uh, preschool services. Well, we have one big goal in mind, more services, more classrooms. And we know that there's about 30 some percent of children are not receiving preschool before entering kindergarten. We know through survey data last year that the children who are unserved 
seem to cluster around three schools, and that's Harding, McKinley, and Franklin. Especially last year, at Harding alone, half of the children entering kindergarten had not had any preschool experiences. Now, this survey doesn't give us information about the home care they're in, and if perhaps there's a preschool component in that day in the home care, that we can't say. So our goals for preschool, preschool services, are to increase, but in the full day model like Children's Center. And we are gonna go after some of that AB 172 money. The grants are coming out the end of October, and we're going to, which is now, oh, that's coming up. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, we are gonna apply for a new classroom, <laughs> an additional classroom. School age services, I know you have declining enrollment, but we do not have declining enrollment in our programs. Uh, we have an increasing demand for child development after school programs, and there isn't any space for us on the elementary sites in most cases to expand. So we've had to look to new creative models. A model I saw in Inglewood School District a couple years ago is where they surveyed the elementary teachers to see if anyone wanted to teach child development after school in their own classrooms. And so we tried that at Peabody, and we actually had two kindergarten teachers who did want to job share, and we were able to expand by 15 children, and then they merge into a homeroom at 4.30 in the afternoon, back to our one classroom. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're looking at new models, uh, expanding, expanding after school enrichment. Well, I really would like to see a collaboration between AOK -OK and the REC program and child development to see how we could share the resources that we have on the campus. Um, and maybe that's a, a goal that we can set for this year. One way we expand enrichment is that parents sign a permission slip for any activity the child wants to participate in on campus. So if they want to take karate, then they sign a permission slip, child checks in our program, goes to the enrichment on campus and comes back for the rest of the afternoon because we, most of our programs stay open until six. Um, hippie services. Well, we want to expand hippie, but every expansion requires dollars and our director spends most of his uh, daily hours um, looking for new money and looking for uh, new money for today and future money for next year because there is no continuous funding for HIPPIE. We want to increase the HIPPIE participation in the Waterford program, the Waterford Early Reading uh, Station use because it wasn't up to our goals last year. And one thought that we have that is going to actually go forward is the director is setting up uh, some stations in the home business office right there on Coda Street, um, and that'll give families another access to the Waterford Early Reading component of the HIPPIE program. Okay, if you looked real close, you could have seen Brian, uh, Brian Services, Brian Tangway's <laughs> daughter in there. Okay. Any questions? Oh, I'd like to see that again. Oh, would you like to see it again, Susan? There's, uh, there, now that's not her. That's her. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she participated in our uh, Preschool for All last year. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very informative presentation. Are there any questions from the board? I, I have a question. We've been talking, we talking about increasing some program services at Harding Elementary School, and I imagine that other schools have similar needs. And it's, in terms of balancing the, f the families that can pay and need to find something which might actually draw families into a school they wouldn't otherwise attend, all the way to the kids on the other end who are, are receiving services. Are, you, are there discussions for other school sites to do a similar model depending on the space available, I guess? Um, because it seems like we have programs in the community for after school care, such as Girls Incorporated, YMCA. There are programs out there, but apparently they are often 
filled and it's hard to find space. So I can see your programs, as you alluded to, expanding to include the, the fee-for-service families who might not be participating today in your programs. And I see that you cut off at third grade. So it, in all of that, there is a question. Why mm -hmm. do we stop at third grade? And then how are you looking at maybe expanding your fee-for-service programs at other sites for after school? Oh, those are all really good questions. Um, well, the first, que the first point I want to make is that on most of the elementary campuses, the programs for after school begin in first grade. And so the, uh, and most of the elementary campuses, kindergarten children uh, were about the only program that they can join. So we uh, wrote a new narrative and we're really focusing on kindergarten children. And in order to stay focused in early education and on the kindergarten through third grade, uh, it was about five years ago, we started phasing out the uh, fourth through sixth grade because a child would enter our program in kindergarten and stay through sixth grade. We never had um, any room in our programs. They were just continuously full. And it is very difficult to provide an exciting curriculum uh, for kindergarten through sixth grade in the same classroom. And, and most of our campuses, we have just one classroom, except Franklin, we have three, Adams, we have three. I forgot to mention that um, Sally Kingston is, was very interested in starting a, a K, a, an enlarged K school age program, which we have done this year. We have 15 children that are outside of our regular school age classroom with an instructor rotating through kindergarten classrooms and then merging in, kind of like the Peabody model. The, con the contracts that we get only give us enough money for so many children. So it's mm -hmm. not like we can you know, take 100 children. We only have enough money to take 50, you know, simplifying it. And the fee for service, at I just started at any school in the district, if we have room and a parent wants to pay, um, then I move a a, a space over. So any, any parent who wants to pay for a space in our school age program, I take them and I have fee, bay, fee paying parents at Harding. So it's, um, I changed that. I've spread them all around. It's the children's centers where I don't have any fee paying slots or spaces. Did I answer your question or? Well, yes, <laughs> and I just it? wanted you to highlight that a little more about the fee for service ideas that you're talking about because I think that's going to fill, to the extent we can meet that need, that's going to fill a need in our, at a lot of our school sites. So thank you for mm -hmm. doing that. Um. No? Okay. I, have, I have one question. Yes, okay. Ms. Malikoff. Um, has there ever been an attempt to study, to see what happens to kids when they go into elementary schools to track your children and see how they do later on? Oh, that's an excellent question. Like well, <laughs> well, we've, um, Tried a couple of times to get into SASE, and it's, it's I, more complicated than I ever imagined. And we thought that we were going to uh, be able to get on, into SASE this year, and it hasn't happened. And we're hoping that now we'll be part of the new ARIES, um, which Davis says absolutely we're going to be part of ARIES. So that way we'll be able to track those children that begin in preschool with us and then onwards. Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Harder? Just a couple really quick questions. I really want to endorse the idea of trying to find a way to merge AOK -OK Park and Rec and the after school enrichment programs. I think a lot of people are confused by it. They don't understand the differences. Um, I think they all have different uh, strengths, and I think that pursuing that would be a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then just question, point, you know, information for, for me. How many uh, uh, teen parents do you serve on the two different high school campuses? Uh, it varies from year to year. Right. Uh, approximately, I would say probably 25 to 30 students at Santa Barbara High School. And um, that includes the prenatal, so we're not actually taking care of that many infants and toddlers. Um, and then I know San Marcos, the last time I checked, had probably um, nine or ten infants and toddlers and probably 15 or 16 uh, teens. Okay, and then I'm sure not an equal division between moms and dads? Many right. more moms than dads? Many more moms than dads. Okay. But we welcome the dads. We yeah. want the dads. Uh, any, any efforts to really try and, and rope them in? Um, 
I think that you know, we, we strongly you know, try to bring them in. I think uh, short of making s some sort of mandatory attendance, I don't think we're going to get more. But we, we always encourage them. We want them there. We uh, welcome them there. And uh, many of them are older. And so they don't necessarily, they're not in high school anymore. OK. So that makes a difference yeah. as well. OK. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. We, we're glad we were able to put you a little earlier in the agenda this evening. Thank you. OK. That brings us to item F2, report on El Puente success. Um, I think Mr. Gonzalez is going to introduce uh, Cecilia Molina and others from El Puente. The board had requested this presentation uh, in earlier discussion about uh, expulsion and what happens to our students who are expelled from our district and go to El Puente. Uh, we decided that we would ask C Cecilia Molina to come in and, uh, and give us a report on that. Mr. Gonzalez? Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you the uh, principal of El Puente Community School, whose uh, organization continues to provide our students a highly beneficial program. Cecilia? Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to introduce um, Victor Prado, who's one of my veteran teachers, been there seven years. He's a, our teacher leader and our literacy coach. He's on the um, just highly respected within our juvenile just uh, court community schools. I'm Cecilia Molina, principal at El Puente. I've been there 19 years, 12 years as a site administrator. Um, in order to understand El Puente, we're, Victor and I are going to share this, so we're going to try to make this work here. Um, tonight, you really need to understand um, the components of El Puente. To understand the success is what leads to it. Tonight, we are going to talk to you about the assessment piece, the, the intensive intervention programs, our standard-based curriculum, our special education programs, counseling, community-based partnerships, safe school policy, and service and leadership. And this will give you, a, hopefully, a, a better understanding of some of you already know about our school. And to uh, just furthermore, to introduce you to our school, is we do have a mission statement at Al Puente. And one of the biggest things is respect, readiness to learn, and to reconnect the students to uh, the school and to the community is very important for us. I have a teaching staff, of, a counseling staff of 24 individuals. First, of course, the school secretary, the first person you see when you come in the door. So we have six regular school, regular teachers, three special education teachers. I have five regular ed special uh, teacher assistants five special ed teacher assistants, one school psychologist, and two full-time um, MFT counselors. So it's a very strong uh, counseling and support staff. Which takes us to assessments. Um, at El Puente, we do a variety of assessments. And one of the ones that we do for our ELL students is the CELL, which is you know a state-mandated assessment. And then also we do um, placement assessments for all students, especially when they enter El Puente, so we know which courses, if they need interventions and whatnot. So one of the first ones is the DAR, which is a diagnostic assessment of reading to see if they're at grade level in their reading and their comprehension. Um, the next one is we do mathematics, so that way they're in their courses, algebra, pre-algebra, pre and whatnot. And then another thing is for our writing program, we do um, uh, school-wide um, writing prompts three times a year. And also with our assessments, um, we also do, you know, obviously, the California High School exit exam. And we just want to show you um, the importance of it and how much we stress, you know, the importance of this test. In 2004, that we've had 98% participation rate. We had 40 students take um, the test and 17 passed. And then the next year was 100% participation rate. I mean, that's followed up with... Um, a, a number of phone calls, letters home, just to stress the importance of this and for their child. And then it takes us to uh, 2006, where we also had 100% participation rate. 45 students participated, and 19 of them um, passed portion of the test. We also wanted to share the growth in our API. Um, the state standard uh, is nine points. 
in 2004, you could see we had a 32-point increase. In 2005, we had a 38-point increase. And we're really proud of uh, 2006 with the new data that came out. We had a 46-point um, increase. We've met our 98% participation rate, and we met our subgroups um, indicators. And then um, just for clarification, the curriculum, which is a very important piece, especially if you're referring students to us, is we have a um, state-adopted intensive and strategic interventions where there is a difference. Um, and some of the um, intensive one is our REIT system, which we have corrective reading, the comp which is um, decoding, comprehension. We also have a writing project. Um, we have the Hampton Brown High Point for our ELL students, you know, which is a state-adopted. Um, we have Saxon Mathematics, and we also just incorporated the numeracy project, which helps us out with the California High School exit exam in the mathematics portion of that. Um, also, <clears throat> just to let everyone know that we do have state-adopted textbooks. Um, we we uh, Predominantly, we use Apprentice Hall. We have the Apprentice Hall Algebra, Pre-Algebra. We have the Apprentice Hall Language Arts and Literature. We do the Apprentice Hall World History and U.S. History. We use Holt for our sciences. And then, um, to round it off for our seniors, we do do the Apprentice Hall Government and Economics books. Also at El Puente, we do have new curriculum opportunities called Cyber High. Now, Cyber High, um, we introduced it to our school in the spring of 06. And it's online courses. They're grade level. Um, they are offer advanced courses and college prep courses. There are 39 uh, choices. And the way we put it in our school, it's offered four periods a day with, student, with teacher support. Um, the growth plan, plan um, for January of 2007 is to have a PC computer lab of 22 um, desktops where a lot more students to use uh, um, enroll in a cyber high within our school day. The courses taken have ranged from health, English, world history, ethnic studies, geometry, government, and economics. Um, these are some of the students that are uh, enrolled right now during the fall semester. When we just first started in the spring of 2006, we had 16 students who participated and earned credit. In summer session, we had 30 students who participated and earned credit. And currently, this fall semester, we have 36 students who are participating in coursework through Cyber High. And just on a note of that, their college prep courses are included. So, you know, for those okay. students that that don't need the interventions and they're more advanced, there are more challenging courses for them to be taking at this time when our other interventions are going on. Which takes us to our um, Special Education Learning Center, which um, we are very fortunate because we have a full array of IEP services which take, them up, take us all the way from our SSTs, our student study teams, anger management groups, all the way to our behavioral specialists. So, all these that you see listed here are services that are actually provided at our school and our students really benefit from all the services. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of our special ed teachers in the Learning Center. Uh, an <laughs> um, another component of our school along with the curricular piece and the special ed is our counseling program. And fighting back, um, through fighting back partnership, I have two um, counselors who and they also provide an array of services ranging from crisis counseling, girls groups, individual counseling, conflict mediations, anger management, to good for drugs. And they also do an ongoing staff trainings on, on important is issues of, from suicide prevention to cutting that we must be aware of as a staff. This is also uh, one of the small counseling group and one of our counselors in the girls group. Fighting back also makes the referrals to community agencies for students fulfilling conditions of the rehabilitation plan. A lot of students who come to us need this help and this assistance. So they help to um, set up the students uh, to CADA, drug alcohol treatment program after school. They help uh, parents to be, um, enroll in the parent intervention classes. They also help students to um, set up community service hours. And new this year, um, we started a bridge program which is the adaptation of teen court classes. For those students who are unable to go to teen court for whatever reasons, now we provide this adaptation program um, twice a week after school. So it is a, like a mini version of teen court. 
And then some additional counseling. Um, we do have some outside groups that come in, such as uh, Los Compadres come in for the young men's group, which is really good because we have a lot of, you know, gang and other issues going on, and they really stress tolerance and, you know, how to succeed without, you know, having problems out in the community. Um, they also help try to reconnect to family, culture, history, school, and community where they really had a lot of disconnect and why they're with us. Um, also, they um, have opportunities to do a lot of different things out in the community to get community service. And then um, connection with higher education. They really stress the importance of education in this group, you know, not to give up to stay in school and, you know, to keep going. Um, in addition to that, we have um, access to Calm, which does uh, family referrals and individual counseling. Um, we're lucky enough to have Share the Word to come to our campus. They do some uh, healthy relationship development in, in the core classroom, so they come in and teach a curriculum in there five or six weeks. Um, we also have a partnership with uh, Planned Parenthood, which comes in and they do healthy relationships for boys and girls groups, so both sides get it, you know, not just the girls or the boys. Um, also, we do some, uh, they come in and do a, um, a full curriculum on uh, health education, which is very beneficial for our, for our site. Since 2001, yearly, we provide over, we provide counseling services for over 300 students in a school year, in, a, in our whole year program. And over 2,500 hours of counseling are provided for our students. <clears throat> And furthermore, we also have other um, community partnerships, which we're fortunate. We have Casa de la Raza, which is just right around the corner from us. And we're able, each of the classrooms is able to use our facility um, an hour per day um, throughout the week. And also after school, they always welcome our students over there afterwards. And they offer art classes. Um, we go there for PE. There's some computer access over there. They do drama and theater, which we did some backdrops for one of the, the middle school or grammar schools for one of the plays that they were putting on. So they incorporated us in that. And also they um, offer community service if students want to go over there and volunteer after school. And some more um, community support is we have some students participating in the Granada Arts Projects. Um, City of Peace, um, they come over and uh, they offer it to our students, as, as well as your students also, City of Peace, where they put on the plays in the community. So all the um, neighborhood um, children are, you know, to go there and participate. And also Santa Barbara Sunrise Rotary Club um, really provide a service for us, which is very nice, which they do Student of the Month awards, which is, we're very thankful for that, for the students to get honored and rewarded for their efforts. Another important component of our school, of course, is safe school policy. Um, it is important in our school that high expectations for student behavior is based on respect, learning to take responsibility for decisions made, and it's supported by the teachers and the counseling staff. We do implement a dress code. We have all students sign a neutral territory agreement, which is a promise to keep the school safe and keep each other safe at school. And we do check our students every day. Um, this is a classroom setting. We do have cameras throughout the school. We supervise students all day. We pr provide supervision for students at arrival, during the day, and most importantly, at dismissal. Our school schedule is aligned to public transportation system. Uh, students have, and, but most importantly, students have access to the counselors all day to provide crisis counseling and conflict mediation. That is an open door policy for all students. Um, this is our lunchroom where students have a break, um, supervised break and supervised lunch, and we do bring lunches in for the, all our students. Okay, um, we're going to talk a little bit about student achievement. <clears throat> and uh, in this one right here, in the fall of 2004, we were able to send 35 students back to the district. Um, in the spring of 2005, we had 28 returning students. In the fall of 2005, we had 36 students return to the district. In the spring of 2006, 22 students returned. Could you and give the, the percentages on those? These are um, uh, 35 students of 150 students enrolled. Uh, we, our, our maximum is 150 students enrolled. Yeah, and then these would be the ones that um, are caught up on their credits and have their rehabilitation it's plan fulfill completed. Fulfill the rehabilitation plan and are up to, are qualified to come back to the Santa Barbara School District. 
And then um, some more of our achievements for our student graduation um, is uh, in June 2004, we did graduate 35 students from our program. Um, in June 2005, 30. And June 2006, this last graduation, we had 28 um, students graduate. At El Puente Community School, um, we honor our, our graduates when you walk into the door with um, all those students on our graduates and the year that they graduated. Alongside is a big poster of our new territory agreement. Be keeping the school safe and staying on task helps students to be successful. This is when you come in, you can see this. El Puente Community School um, it has become a state model community school. Uh, we, the leadership team has presented at many state conferences and instructional conferences. And we continue to be visited by schools throughout our state that want to see how an alternative school like ourselves can work with at-risk kids, bringing in intervention programs, core curriculum, working with partnerships. So we have hosted quite a bit of folks from all the way from San Jose to Calaveras County. Um, in summary, El Puente Santa Barbara provides all students the opportunity to fulfill the rehabilitation plan. We provide all students with a safe and positive educational setting. And we are meeting the needs of all students special education kids, students with IEPs, English language learners, students that are in need of intensive interventions in case you remediation and preparation, and now we offer advanced online courses. We also um, provide students with the opportunities for dual enrollment at Santa Barbara City College through our, uh, while they're enrolled in our independent study program. And we constantly uh, provide a full array of counseling services for all the students. And I'm really proud of the fact that my staff is very dedicated and focused and hardworking on all and the complete needs of the students that come to El Puente. And as you can see, our program is complex. It's not as simple, but every component is vital to make it work at our school. So as we reported, you know, the successes, it's really come with a lot of time and hard work. Um, and we really wanted to show you statistics for the last three years that we were able to take. But when we do send students back and look at the success, remember it's at the, every semester. So if you look at the rates, it's almost 90 students that, that are having success within a, school, within a given school year. So do you have any questions for us? Good, thank you, Ms. Molina. Um, board members, Ms. Rodriguez. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Each time you come, I think this is maybe the third time you've come before us since I've been on the board, and I always appreciate hearing this all the information about what's going on. And um, as you know, sitting in on the expulsion hearings, we always have lots of um, questions that come from families about the school, is it safe? A lot of fears and concerns that parents have. Right. And it's great for you to be able to address a lot of those things in these presentations. Um, I have a lot of questions. I'm gonna go really quickly. Sure. Seventh and eighth graders that end up there, um, how, are they kept in any way separately or how do you address their needs which are maybe a little different? No, they're not separated out. Um, our, we have five classrooms um, in the mor that we're able to put the, some of the younger students with maybe ninth graders, but the curriculum is, um, we, we do school-wide reading program, a school-wide mathematic, and a school-wide um, uh, uh, literature, I'm sorry, literature. So within those three periods, then they're tested into the right curriculum, the three periods a day. And, if, and they are assimilate and then, well, even though they're younger, there's not Right, as long as, we, as long as we provide the counseling services and supervision. Okay. Absolutely, supervision is gonna be key. Yeah, Thanks. that's why assessment is the key on that. It helps us place them in the appropriate settings. Okay, thank you. Um, on independent study, you talked about some of the kids are able to do uh, dual enrollment. How do they qualify for that? Is that any student that wants to do that can, or is that based on your evaluation of their ability to? Our independent study is, um, is very unique. Um, we offer it um, two hours a day, for four days a week. So it's not one, one time, it's to, to give the students more support. So they're taking a, and we try to really um, offer it to the older students, the seniors um, that are gonna graduate from El Puente. And so they're one step into the Santa Barbara City College while they're still uh, finishing their, um, their coursework for a diploma. That way, uh, they take the coursework from Santa Barbara City College, bring it to El Puente, and we give them more support. So that when they graduate, and especially when the summer program, when they do the bridge program, they have continue to have that, that support at Santa Barbara City College. 
Yeah, a lot of our students, um, when they do the dual enrollment, they'll come into the morning session and then go straight up to City College for a class or two. That's great to get that clarified because we have these discussions and want to know a little bit more about how that would work for some of the students that, you know, you're not exactly sure what's the best place right. for them. And right. that really helps meet the need along with the cyber high, which I right. appreciate all the work you've done to get that up and yeah. running. That's taken a little bit of time for a lot of different reasons, but it really, the computer system needed to really run off a PC. So we're really trying to develop it by steps. But one thing we have noticed with cyber high, the need to give the teacher support and to set mm -hmm. it up at four mm -hmm. periods a day. That's, that, that's, that's crucial. That sounds, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, on, for special ed students that end up at El Puente um, and you go through the process like you would at any school with an IEP and providing supports, when they go back, if they go back to a comprehensive high school or junior high school, are they, um, do you liaison then with, how does that work? Because that seems like a pretty important right. that's transition. That's a great question. I'm happy you asked it. We host a transfer IEP meeting in our school site. And we invite, um, um, the special ed director um, from your district, and they contact the, the appropriate schools that that student will be transferred to, and that resource teacher or whoever from that high school is invited to our school, and we meet with the parents and go through the full um, services that we've provided at Oak Point and how we can make that transition uh, fairly smooth for the student returning. So we, we do host those uh, transfer IP meetings. Great. And Thanks. that's a great way to bring the student into the back. back. Okay. Mm -hmm. I pr thank you very much for that. Um, and then just one, I think I just have one more question on, it seems that a lot of our students that, that come to El Puente and then they come back to us, um, they've had a chance to really catch up and even sometimes get beyond, they can go faster, I should say, in, in your program. Do you want to talk a little bit about the opportunities that students have? You know, because we like to try to right. promote that with families that they can actually well, go pretty one quickly. One thing that happens, and I, I really like to clarify, our summer session, is a very long summer session. It's 11 weeks. And we go through, um, and our spring semester is actually two weeks longer than the districts because we don't have a spring break. So it's, so we literally go almost 240. Year round. We are literally, literally year round. Our built in break, the only one that the school site is shut down, is a two weeks over the winter break. Okay. Right. So we do have more instructional days, and our summer is a, a full semester. So that right there really helps you know you know get that deficit start taken away from that and the other opportunity is um, if the students were on the day program they receive credit for the day program um, courses which is uh, six offerings and then they could um, it would the work with the teacher get an independent work which would be extra but not part of the core not part of the day schedule for additional extra credit which is more independent work Mm -hmm. But it cannot, it's not part of anything that it would go done. into the elective, not in the core, you know, standard base right. that we teach. So, highly motivated students have lots of opportunity. Lots of opportunity. Correct. And the most important thing is they're there every day, especially in the summer session. They can really make up some good credit 25 credits, possibly. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Arter, did you have a question? I did about your API, and your gains are really impressive. Yeah. And m the majority of those students must be new to you each year. Is that correct? Or how many, you know, when we can look at, at API scores from our comprehensive high schools right. and it's about the same group of kids from ninth grade to 10th grade to 11th grade, but your cohort of students must change dramatically from one year to the next. Yes, that's correct. So we account, these are the students that were with us at uh, CBITS. Okay. That's, that's how it's included in our, uh, for the county. From, so one, from one year to the next, because our expulsion order is rarely for longer than a year. In right. fact, I've never seen one for longer than a year. Right. How many students choose to stay at El Puente? Well, one of the things with that, the expulsion may be a year, but they have to complete a rehabilitation. You know, the rehabilitation right. plan, which sometimes takes really longer. takes a, okay. a little bit longer than that, like an extra semester or so. Okay. So we're averaging at least, what, three semesters? Three full semesters. Okay. Three full semesters because you know, there's a counseling piece and all that, so they really have to complete each and every one of them. We really stress that Thank you. to them. Right. That, that's important to know. And then, Madam Chair, I'm assuming you are going to have Ms. Molina introduce her faculty who is here. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question as well. Did, I'm sorry, Ms. Malikoff, did you have Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Sure. Um, I'm just, because we, when we're dealing with the, the expulsions as, I think Ms. Rodriguez mentioned, um, we're constantly looking at what would be the best environment for individual students. And there's often questions about 
whether El Puente would be the best environment for the student. Would, are there, for, well, for which group of students or what type of student do you think would not be a, a good candidate for El Puente? <laughs> That's a tough question. Yeah. I mean, we provide all the services and now that we have the cyber high, even the students that are higher achieving, now we can also provide those services so they can exceed and accelerate. So that, I mean, you know, I'm not our really focus sure. has been for students. We understand and we know that all the students who come to El Puente have had some type of behavior problem in regular ed mm -hmm. for whatever reason. The range is there. So we're focused on that. What we're trying to do is better understand maybe the behavior and then provide better services. I mean, that's why our counseling keeps, uh, in, like the bridge program, um, some of the students weren't doing their routine court. And then when and not able to get go back, so then we set it up after school. So we're constantly trying to uh, fill those gaps and those excuses at the school. But behavior problems, I mean, that's that we know that um, mm -hmm. we're very focused on that, and, and that's <laughs> we, that's what. Kind of and just with a say. smaller <laughs> setting and the constant supervision is why our students thrive because right. with that, you know, without being supervised, things can happen and. We're always very regimented, and this is what the very day structured. very structured. Yeah. Well, I, okay, thank I, you. I might be able to answer that just a little bit. I was thinking, for example, of populations that might be better served by, say, a summit high school where they have a more focused program on their 12 step recovery or something well, like that. Well, there's students that are, are committed to sobriety and have been yes. gone through a treatment program and are in that, absolutely. Our students are, uh, again, behavior problem students that are, haven't made those commitments yet. Yes. And hopefully the experience at El Puente will give them that option down the road. Yes. I mean, that, that's our goal, always. That was a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. M Ms. Malikoff? Um, I have questions about numbers. I want to thank you first for, uh, it sounds like uh, you do a wonderful job. Um, I'm, do our, most of the students that come to your school from our district? Yes. Are most <laughs> of the students from, that go to your school for, as a result of expulsions from our district? No, 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 no. Some students um, have been ordered through probation and some students have come. Um, believe it or not, parents have heard about the program prior, you know, as they're beginning to have uh, problems with truancy and problems with sus uh, suspensions and want the students supervised and counseling. They make the calls to volunteer. I guess I'm not aware of the, the court ordered ones, uh, so I assume uh, that the uh, students? Through probation, they, again, they're looking for the supervision of the students. So they have done something outside of the schools that have yes. gotten them to, and what percentage about is that of your students? Uh, about 30, 30%. Okay, so I guess I, I'm really interested in is just the small, well, the two thirds maybe, or maybe less than that, of the ones that we expel and what happens to them, because it would, it, we, we never hear from them, <laughs> well, so we don't know, and I just well, they, they they come back to you. Um, that's why those students that are able to come, well, they come back uh, to the district at the beginning of a semester. That's mm -hmm. the key. That's why we have the stats at the fall, and so, because those are the key times they've done, the, they've, they've fulfilled the rehabilitation plan. They don't come back to the board, they go through um, right, Michael uh, Gonzalez and then to the site principals, but mm -hmm. they, there is that gateway. Yeah, and just one of those stipulate, they can't return to that school that they were expelled sure, from. Sure so they might it. go to one of the other high schools or, or right. one of the La Cuesta, so they do filter back in. Right. So I, I'm curious, you just said it was on average three semesters that they're with you and that's the expulsions. Because we get them, they beg us please only one semester, not two, and I'm curious, this three sounds, I'm, I'm just sur surprised. Uh, sometimes students, um, when, do they, um, when they come, there, there's other problems too besides the, the, the need to fulfill the rehabilitation. They've gotten themselves behind in mm -hmm. schoolwork and credits, and they haven't fulfilled the rehab, which is sometimes the six months clean drug testing, the, the, all the teen court classes and the community service hours. So they need to really get a lot of support, especially the counseling piece, in order to start making those decisions to focus on those other pieces. Because all of that's done after school, some, and some of those in mm -hmm. late afternoon. So the more structure we put in in the morning, then the, the, well, the hope is that they will continue that structure in the afternoon. But some students, it takes a little bit more time yeah. than uh, others. 
and, and a lot of times, too, um, I've had plenty of students that stay two semesters longer because they know deep down inside that they're not, not ready right. to not have this extra support and this extra structure and that they will get lost in the crowd and start making some poor choices. Yeah. Mm -hmm, so absolutely. sometimes it really is until they're really comfortable because we don't want to set them up for failure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose some of them come to you at 11th grade and they just stay and I, do you have a dropout rate? No, don't, we can't. I mean, our, our whole point is that we're, gonna, we're either going to graduate those students or they're going to go back to the school district. I mean, those are the two avenues with our students. What happens when they don't show up? Well, then we go through the truancy media, uh, okay. the district attorney's uh, truancy program. We'll use that avenue, too. That's available to us, and we are part of that. But that is, we're also a partner in that. Mm -hmm. So we will go through those steps, and then hopefully and we have to start the student, whatever we have to do to get added support. Okay. Yeah. There's only two, you know, it's a, the high school diploma, either with San Barbara School District or Duel Puente. It would somehow be nice to know uh, sort of the, if the numbers could be broken out by our expulsions and just to see exactly how, they how, they, how many come back and how long they spend and just uh, I think we'd all be reassured. Well, <laughs> we too, like your district, are uh, I'm, um, getting Aries <laughs> yes. and we'll be able to tag that information. All, everything that we do right now is through Excel. It's through uh, Excel spreadsheets. So I do it, so it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's paper driven. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can see that the, that avenue, we should be able to tag that. So maybe, you know, we put, should be able to even have better statistics for you and be able to answer those kind of questions. That would be wonderful. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Well, we, we knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> to follow up on that, and this is something that I think is directed at our district, not because I don't think it's stats that you would be able to provide. Um, one of my concerns in asking for this uh, kind of a review was for us to track the success of our students when they do return. So when our students do re-enter our district, how successful are they being in graduating from one of our high schools? And of course, you don't have that information, our, we do. So um, that's something that I would certainly like to follow up on and have that information as well because my, cons my initial concern was in looking at our, our expulsion, is our expulsion practice leading to ultimate success for the student. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like many of them are having success um, when they're, while they're with you, and so I'd like to know if they're having success when they come back to us. Mm -hmm. So, but. Yeah, we're, that's, we just talked about We, that we were today. just at a data oh. team <laughs> training today up at the county office, and one of our concerns was, yeah, how do we track and see how well they did when they return, so. Mm -hmm. That's we're in sync. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> good. Thank you. Yeah. That actually raises a question for me about, we talked about the kids with IEPs coming back in and transitioning. What's the transition for a student not on an IEP? Is there a meeting with the counselor or? Um, the student that is, um, the regular ed student meets, uh, I, meet, make the, I meet with the parent and the student and then we make the uh, meetings for them with Michael Gonzalez and then he meets with them and then they, they meet with the site that they're going to go to. So they have three meetings, one at my level, one with Michael Gonzalez, and then one at the school that they're re-entering. And is there a meeting with the counselor to sort of, because I'm sure they probably need a little extra help uh, well as they get started. At our school? No, I mean, it would be at your end. Yeah, yeah. I at guess that end. is a question for our yeah, staff. Yeah, that's then. for us, We're, I think. We wear all those hats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Well, very I much. would like you to introduce your staff yeah, who's here with great. you. And yeah, we appreciate their being here. Yeah, tonight. I really appreciate them being here. We're we're actually a pretty early morning staff, <laughs> so um, so some of my folks came this morning. In the far back is Sarah Rowland, one of our counselors, Dan Umania, uh, Mr. Tolbert, uh, Mr. Gillen, and Miss Daniels, our special education teacher. Great. Well, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it, Dr. Noel. Yes, I have uh, I have two. Uh, there are two things that always trouble me in our expulsion hearings. They don't happen with, uh, with great frequency, but when they happen, they happen with great poignancy. Um, one is when a, a student expresses fear uh, to, about going to El Puente, uh, having to do with gang associations. And uh, it can be even to the point where the student you know, thinks that for sure he's going to be physically harmed 
uh, by going there, and uh, and uh, when that when that is convincing, it's extremely difficult. And the other one uh, has been touched upon uh, is when a student who is really pretty good academically, uh, you see, a, you look down the history of the grades, you see a lot of A's, a lot of B's, but uh, smoke some dope or or drink some uh, some booze, uh, and maybe and more than twice, more than once, right? It wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, and we worry then that, well, do you really have programs uh, to, to meet his, uh, his or her needs? I understand you have uh, online learning. I, I have, I, I'd like to know more about the context of that and uh, you know, I have some concerns about whether everyone can interface with a, uh, an instructional program uh, online and what kind of support they get in real time from you folks. So those are my two. Uh, areas of concern. Yeah, and, and those are good questions. And a lot of the times with students, it's the fear of the unknown. Okay, and if you probably look at some of those students that are are raising those issues in their track records, that you know they don't want to be expelled. So there's going to be a lot of things that are being said that you know try to convince not to be expelled. But usually when they come in and they do their intakes and then they're sat, the parents are sat down, and they're exposed to. You know, everything that we do at our program with all the support services, they're constantly monitored. We have two to three adult staff in the classroom at a time. It's pretty much, you, you don't see that in a traditional setting. So they're monitored by adults at their, re at their breaks for the restroom, um, at their lunch at all times. There's never a point in time that they're uh, ever unmonitored at our school site. So it's actually a very safe place and we do have cameras now. So if anything does happen, um, it could be reviewed. What so happen, what happens? One of the fears they express is that they, that they they I've heard that acknowledged. They say, but when I when I leave, is when the problem is getting getting out of there and getting home. And we actually, yeah, and you're not going to find this in any other That's school, good. but we actually escort our students. We have staff, and in fact, many of my staff that are here today. If you ever drive by the school at dismissal, we're outside um, at the bus stops. At the bus stops. We take a group down Gutierrez to State Street. We take another group down Gutierrez to Milpas. We really literally escort our students. So we put an additional half an hour to 45 minutes after school every single day for and our that's students. That's very helpful. And that, is to, and that is absolutely right because parents have come to me with concerns too. And we, will, we do everything. They listen to those concerns and step up whatever we have to do. Absolutely. And when we do do the, our dismissal process at the end of the day, it's one classroom at a time. Right. They get their stuff, and then once it's clear, we send the next. So that way there, there's no just congregating out front. Everyone goes on right. their ways, and then we constantly radio to the next staff. There's a group coming, and if there's anything suspicious, we'll just, you know, call dispatch or whatnot. So. You'll never see 100 students at the same time it, because it's 25 kids at a, you know, at a, in rotations. I mean, we've even done our dismissal in, in that fashion to keep students safe yeah. and to make sure they get to their cars and escort them out. So yeah. that's good to know. Whatever concerns you know, please let me know because we make adjustments all the time. Well, I, I thought you only had about 30 students because I've never seen more than about 30 at a time. That's why. That's why. <laughs> then, then we're doing it right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then your next question is, um, we do... All of our materials are state adopted. So if they are doing, you know, literature, they're doing 12th grade literature, econ, and government that are all state adopted books. So those are at their grade levels. Also, we do have um, independent studies. If that is a better option <coughs> for that student, you know, that excels, works better alone, um, is very motivated. And then with the, the cyber high, you know, it's, it's run through Fresno County and can pull up websites and get information on that. But that is starting to spread throughout other districts and whatnot. So those, yeah, not every student thrives with a computer right. in, in front of them. So they, are, they can be in the regular classrooms, which we offer courses at their level, at their grade level, to, and try to keep motivating them. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. Thank you. Well, I've appreciated the tours you've offered to board members, and I think that has been extremely helpful for us to be able to come on campus to see what's there to get a sense of, of the safety factor and, and the right. supervision and, and what's going on in the classroom. I mean, there's a lot of learning going on. Right. So I think sometimes the parents haven't had that exposure. Right. And it's we always encourage, we often encourage them to right. come to the school before they make their and judgments. And they do, several parents do do. And we do meet with parents three times a year too. 
the teachers meet with, we have parent teacher conferences three times a year to um, set up how the students, how they're earning credit, where they are by the end for the report card period, and what do they need to do to either continue for the next semester or if they're ready to go back to the Santa Barbara School District. So we do a lot of parent teacher co uh, conferences too. So thank you. And thank you again for all your support. We appreciate it. Um, well, it helps me to have a great staff, and thank you again. Well, thank you for, for working with our students. Uh, I just want to say, Cecilia, I want to, uh, to just thank you for the incredible partnership with our district. Uh, I consider you and your staff as community heroes here, and your program is not only a state model, I think it's a national model. You do incredible things with the children we send you, and then you send them back. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And with that, I think we can move to a break. So we will take a 15 minute break and we will return. Okay, we are now on item F3. The first reading of elementary social studies instructional materials adoption of Harcourt School Publishers Reflection for kindergarten through sixth grades. Robin Sawaski will make this presentation. She has been waiting for this for some time. <laughs> yes, we've been waiting quite a while. Yes. Uh, a year ago, the state board adopted the new series, those that you could select from. And then last January, our county education office had their fair that they often do, or they always do, I think, for new materials. And so we had teachers and administrators go and visit. Then we had the representatives from the companies come down from, I think it was about five of the selections. And then the teachers from that group, teacher leaders selected three of those that we would actually pilot in the school. So we did that last spring. It was very, very close as far as where the, the teachers fell, the, where they thought the best program was. Harcourt won out in the end after going back again. Uh, we had a really dedicated selection committee that went back and really looked at the materials very carefully and, and talked to the kids as well as the staff. And so here we are with the first reading. It's available. The books are available. We have them upstairs in the um, in our offices there. But the parent group, uh, the parent advisory council has seen them. Curriculum council's done a lot of work with it, and uh, we feel that it's a, a good choice. And we are required to adopt a standards-based history social studies curriculum, K K six in this case. Board members, questions. Just one. I mean, it, uh, I know that we're required to uh, adopt uh, texts that are state approved and standards based. How many choices were there on the state adoption list? Uh, more than two. Okay. Okay. That, that <laughs> it's was not like the reading. Yeah. Okay. Right. No, there were several. Um, the the two that we were deciding between were very very close. I mean, all of the textbooks for this series were very similar. There was one that had quite a bit more technology involvement. In fact, it relied almost 90% of it was on technology, and we were a little afraid. As much as we wanted to move in that direction, we didn't feel like we had the infrastructure or the, the hardware in the elementary district at this point for that. These do have those components. There are, um, the Harcourt has a very nice support for English learners. Um, we, we felt all around it was the best one, but we did have a lot of selection. I, I guess what I'm driving up to is you really felt like you found something that was a good fit for our students and our district as opposed to, I mean, when the choices are very limited, sometimes it's, you know, the lesser of two, you know, mediocre choices. Right. No, I don't feel these are media, mediocre choices. The, the series now are, are really complete. I mean, there's more than you could actually do, particularly given our day, but they nicely interface and coordinate with our, our reading programs. They, they've really had to do that to get the, you know, the, the uh, participation. So you're welcome to look at them. <laughs> I was just gonna ask you if you could maybe identify th three or four criteria that 
tipped the oh. the scale in the direction of this particular program? Good question. And one of the top criteria was the support for English learners. We looked at the um, ease in which a teacher could use the materials, given the fact that we've got this incredible reading program that's huge and our math program. So how easy can you open it up, look at the materials, and just implement it? Um, another thing was how the standards um, were identified and um, you know the work that the kids did in there. I mean, they and then they went to like you know the pictures and the you know, what, how the students would react to it. But I would say the the EL support, the ease for the um, teachers, the assessments. They wanted to see that as well. Thank you. Uh, Any oh, you just Ms. one Order? more question mm -hmm. based on what you just mm -hmm. asked. Uh, accommodations adaptations for high flyers. Yes, the yes, there are lots of ways that they differentiate, and um, there's extra support pieces, there's um, hints for the teacher, there's, um, you know, like using um, the real documents and that kind of thing, yeah. Simulations, I mean, there's lots of stuff to use on the internet and that kind of stuff, too. Great, thank you. So I'll okay. bring it back. So we'll, this will be coming back to us. Will it be coming back to us for adoption at yes. on, the, on the next? Uh -huh. And I, what I'd okay. like to do too is give you a little bit of the cost breakdown. We're in the process of; it's very. Ex they're all very. Uh, that expensive. was gonna, that was a question I forgot to ask. Was um, was there a dramatic cost difference from among the programs, or were they all pretty much in the same range? They're all pretty similar, except the one that had the technology piece was cheaper. But given the fact that we'd have to buy all the technology, I mean, we had we don't have computers in all mm -hmm. the classes mm -hmm. for that kind of use. It ended up to be way more expensive mm -hmm. in the end. Um, but of course, it's funded through our instructional materials money that we get from the state. So it's not, right. you know, at this point, right. we're not looking at any other. We'll have to see what the bottom line is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Then we will move on to item. A discussion of possible study, I'm sorry, discussion of possible study of elementary district fiscal solvency. Um, I'm Say that three times fast. I'm going to ask Bob Wolf to, do, to uh, comment on this. I do want to tell you what I have been doing, though. Uh, since we had an opening for an assistant superintendent of business services, I thought uh, what more important role is there for a person in a position like this than to conduct a, a study of the fiscal solvency, especially of the elementary district. And along those lines, then, I use that as a major criteria for the selection of Ed Diaz as our new assistant superintendent for uh, business services and I made it clear to him that uh, he would probably be asked to do that. Uh, I also asked uh, Bob to, Bob Wolf, to contact uh, uh, student services to see what a, co what a study might run us uh, in terms of money. And, school and services? I'm sorry, school services. Uh, and what it might bring us uh, by way of a report. Uh, so I would like uh, Bob Wolf to comment on that. I contacted School Services of California, and after much wrangling with them, finally got an estimate of cost uh, in a range. And the range runs anywhere from thirty to fifty-five thousand uh, dollars. Now, this is coming out of a school district that really doesn't have any spare money to do, and so the question would obviously raise: Which teacher do you want to fire in order to conduct the study to find out how you can have fiscal solvency? Which is why, sort of, we've held off on that to let Mr. Diaz come in with his expertise, because he has quite a bit, from what I understand, uh, to look at, look at and see if he needs to you know, move forward with that, or he can do it himself. OK, thank you. To me, that seemed logical. Um, board members, any comments or questions? Yeah, my comment is that you shouldn't audit yourself. Uh, that they, should, they need a third opinion, but that's, you've heard me say that many times. Uh, I wonder if it might be possible. That's a thought. Sure, that's a lot of money for the elementary district. Uh, maybe for less. I mean, first of all, Mr. Mr. Diaz is going to have, his, his, I would assume, his hands full for a while getting uh, getting up to speed on our district, and uh, so that I don't know quite the time frame that you have in mind here. Uh, 
Could maybe that I should put that in the form of a question. What's the time frame? For the assistant superintendent, since they report to me, uh, I ask them to set goals for the year and, uh, and to set uh, a time frame on it. Uh, so uh, I will be meeting with him when he comes on board. And I will uh, talk to him about what his goals are. And, and if you want him to do this, uh, I don't see why he wouldn't do this why, or why he shouldn't do this. Um, then I will ask him what a reasonable amount of time uh, should be to, to get this done. Well, what priority are you, uh, you're, his, you're his boss, what priority are you going to assign this? Well, frankly, it's not ahead of delivering the interim budget reports on time. I mean, there's some, s some established state timelines uh, for budget reporting so that the fir first I think interim are is critical. Like, when's the first interim? Uh, first interim is coming up December 15. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't anticipate uh, having this evaluation done uh, until after the second interim? Well, I don't know. I, you know, I'll have to work with Ed on it. I had some other questions, but I, I want to make sure. I don't know if Dr. Noel's note taking and has more questions. I'm just, I'm right now having, I'm note taking, but while I'm doing that, why don't you ask your questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, th thank you for the cost estimate from school services. Um, I think we also need to figure into that um, staff time that have to, would have to be devoted to that activity that would take them away from regular activities because I was actually relatively new to the board when we engaged FICMAP the last time around and it was uh, very, uh, required a, an intense uh, investment of staff time, board time, um, and you know, executive time, if you will, um, the assistant superintendents. So I, I suppose that if we were really going to s take a serious uh, look at whether or not we should go forward with this. I, I think we'd have to get some sense of, of how much uh, staff time would have to be involved. But I think the bigger question is, what is it we want to accomplish? Um, I don't think we can afford to have them come in and just take a wholesale look at uh, the finances of our elementary school district. I think that we need to have some goals in mind. What is it we're trying to accomplish? Um, are we trying to meet our, our GASB uh, requirements for next year? Are, are we looking to uh, close an elementary school? Um, those, those kinds of very specific questions rather than, you know, come on down and, and look us over. Um, so I, I think, you know, given the fact that Mr. Diaz isn't going to start until November 1st, we probably still have some time to have a conversation about this. Um, and my preference would to be to not do it in-house, um, but there's a big cost associated with it, and I'm wondering if we can focus that expense if we had some specific goals in mind. You say your preference is? Not to, not to do it in-house, uh -huh. to go outside. Yeah. Um, but given, given the price tag associated yeah. with it, I think it's gonna require some, you know, as I said, focused goals and also some, some uh, close examination of where we would even find half that amount of money to, to uh, deal with it. Mm -hmm. oh. yes. uh, well, I, 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 I certainly uh, feel, I, I think you make very good points, Mrs. Harder, and uh, I would just add also that to do it in-house is, is also gonna take the staff time uh, and and Mr. Diaz's time of, as well, so there's no cost-free way to do it, uh, and and uh, you know, one of them maybe doesn't take cash in hand, take cash out of hand uh, as much as the other, but I agree if there's some way to focus it, and I and and I I read I read Mrs. Ms. Stark's uh, recommendation. She made it in two different, she made it in writing in two different places. One 
In one, it was tied to the question of closing a school very clearly. In the other one, she left out that kind of qualification and made it sound, it sounded more like a general purpose audit. But I thought, I, I thought if I, as I reflected on her comments and the context, that the main focus was a, 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 an audit to, a, a, what she called it, a solvency audit, having to do with closing a school. Um, and uh, maybe that, that would be the f one focus. And I think be because, because it's felt that that is a sensitive issue, that it would be, I mean, if, if that is a real prospect, I think it would be helpful to, to the board and to the community to have a third opinion on that, to have an outside opinion it, uh, because, because of its sensitivity. Uh, and, if, and maybe that would be the, uh, a narrower, narrower focus uh, might uh, uh, reduce the cost a bit. You know, also, you might see if FICMAT would do it for less. Uh. Uh, may I ask you? Um, you keep referring to this as an audit. Uh, maybe I'm, using I Mary, I'm just using Mary's terms. Uh, and she called it an audit? Oh, yeah. Fiscal solvency audit. Yeah, and, and I, I had not heard that term well, before. I've I'm heard not, audit before. Maybe I'm not clear about what you're looking for here. Uh, when I talked to Ed Diaz, I said, I want a thorough study. I want someone who can do a thorough study of the finances, and I'd like them to focus at the elementary level. I'd like them to look at our revenues, look at uh, ways to maximize our revenues, project our revenues, look at our expenses look at ways to be more uh, effective in, in controlling costs, project that out, uh, and show us what the long-term solvency of the district will be and suggest measures that we could take. In fact, you saw the, you saw the written question on it. No, um, no. What measures we might be able to take to, um, uh, uh, to put us in a better financial light uh, over the long run and my tendency is to have him go ahead with that and if we feel we need more information uh, we could certainly do that after he gives it a run uh, and I, I certainly agree with you if we're looking at something like closing a school instead of just jumping at that um, having an outside uh, consultant or outside party look at that uh, I think is certainly important to that process. I would think that timing would also be a factor in the sense that if one of the recommendations is to close the school yes. and we're looking at possibly, you know, when would when that happen, would it happen as soon as the fall of next year, then we don't want to wait. If that's a reality, I'm just, maybe that's not a reality, but we don't want to wait until the last minute if we Absolutely. do discover that there's going to be an issue need to set something in motion now I mean that's really a parallel track if, with the facilities master plan discussions and discussions with the community about the best use of our facilities I mean I would worry that we would wait and do something maybe in the spring and then if we did decide that it was imperative to to move on a school closure and then we start a community discussion about it I think that we need to have some parallel activities going on here and, and not wait too long if, if part of that outcome is going to be perhaps looking at closing the school. Mm -hmm. So I'm just asking the question of timing with that piece of it because that was a big, that was something she mentioned in her yeah. recommendation. Well, well, well Mr. Wolf has, has told us that, I, for, I could almost paraphrase it, that uh, the elementary district is in trouble and the bottom line was that, the, and things are going to be worse. and and. Uh, and, and I, would, I would concur about the timing uh, being very important uh, because I, I, my, at least my vision of, of, of how s serious consideration of closing a school should proceed is first we get the analysis uh, and that includes you know, not just the economic analysis but also the, the mapping, the uh, planet analysis, uh, the name of the computer program. Uh, and, 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 you know, what are the options for, for compressing uh, or collecting the students into other places? But that, and, and then, that, then you go into a, some kind of a public discussion process. And I think that has to be as early as possible so that families 
get used to the idea and have a chance to give input into it so that it doesn't become an upheaval in the community, but more that something where, where people have really understood the, the, the need to do it, understood the alternatives, uh, and if, you know, if, if they don't embrace it, at least, at least uh, uh, understand it uh, uh, enough to, to uh, recognize the necessity. Ms. Harder? I just want to say from your mouth to God's ear if it ever comes to that because th this community tends not to work that way. Do you know what I'm saying where you try and communicate on multiple occasions and engage the community and that sort yeah. of thing and then there's always the 11th hour sort of you know crisis. Or well it's, it's, okay. my, it's my youthful idealism Mrs. Harder. Okay okay I'm happy to hear that. Um, well I do I just have one more question or suggestion and I don't know if if this is um, out of bounds or not. But Dr. Noel heard one particular thing and it s seems as though your understanding of what Ms. Stark said was different, Dr. Sarvis, or what she was trying to communicate. And I didn't attend that meeting, I was on vacation. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't have benefit of it. Um, would it be worth a, you know, a 10 minute conversation with Ms. Stark get the certainly. clarification that you need. She certainly has nothing to lose in terms of certainly. telling you exactly what she thinks at this point. Um, and that might be very useful well, to she put, it, she put it in writing. We have a, we have a memo from her. Well, oh, we have it in the past board, uh, yeah. board materials. Okay. Yes. But, but I still, but it's she might care to elaborate. Yeah. With her. I still think clarification might be helpful. And, and that in fact is why I uh, shopped around the, uh, uh, the written question for candidate interviews thinking that if someone wanted something else in there that they would let me know. Um, I didn't hear that. Okay. Well, I can't ignore the irony of having to spend a great deal of money to find out whether we don't have enough money. Um, it's, you know, we're doing, you know, putting a further strain on our budget to find out how strained our budget is. Um, so. There's, you know, and, and yet, clearly it's, it's something we need to do, but I just really can't help but think that starting with our new as, as, as assistant superintendent, I always want to say associate, mm -hmm. assistant superintendent, um, and finding out as much information as we can up front would be the way to start so that we could have a much more focused idea of what we would want to bring in a consultant to do if we were in fact to decide to do that um, rather than sort of having to focus once the consultant is already being paid and um, you know on our running up a tab so I'd rather have the focusing done first which I think some of us were saying already anyways um, and I would expect that Mr. Diaz would be able to help us identify how we would want to move forward on this. Well, uh, let me suggest uh, that we could have him set out a plan for us and talk to the board about what would be done in a study like this and get the board direction on how to proceed. And if the board felt that we needed to go outside, we certainly could. I think that sounds like an excellent well, I'd, I'd way to like proceed. To, I'd like to put I, I think we need to put the, the examination of the possibility of closing a school at the top of the list mm -hmm. and, not with, and not delay on it because if that turns out to be the case, I hate, hate to repeat myself too much, uh, I'll repeat Mrs. Uh, Rodriguez, if it turns out to be the case, uh, we, want, we want lots of lead time to have a process that, that minimizes the, uh, the negative impact. Uh, let, uh, let me respond to that. Um, I understand that closing a school is one way to save expenses, significant expenses, and in fact it gener generates some revenues. Uh, and we have other school programs that are coming to us asking to rent space at La Cumbra School or, or anywhere else in the district since uh, we're in declining enrollment and we won't need those schools. Um, our enrollment decline has not been that great and, and so far I've just been holding them off. Um, 
is this simply about closing a school or is this about the solvency of the elementary budget? In other words, maximizing revenues, cutting expenses, and closing a school would be one of those potential elements. A and I think that's a very important question because, uh, well, I'll stop with that. Well, I yeah. think, no, I think well, so too. The way, the way Mary put it was that uh, the, the critical factor in the insolvency is the decline in the enrollments uh, and the but the fix the, which makes variable income to, mm -hmm. against the fixed cost of keeping schools open keeping a school open and uh, but I but I wouldn't disagree with you uh, mm -hmm. there are there are other other factors that go into the, into the budget too uh, Mary's recommendation was that we have a two percent uh, increase in our reserve and we've heard uh, uh, Mr. Wolf talked about the consequences of scraping by with, with, uh, uh, with no surplus reserve. Uh, that the, you know that this has this is profound stuff. We've got the Gatsby, 45. Gosh, I'm getting, been at it too long talking this jargon. Who 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 knows what Gatsby 45 means except the people in this room. Uh, so we've got this requirement to to fund our unfunded liability for retiree benefits, uh, and it it's it's substantial. Uh, with a big impact, uh, according to Mr. Wolf, uh, going to hit us in uh, 07. Uh, that's not all that far away. So certainly, I, I don't think I don't think closing a school would solve the whole problem by any means. So I, I agree con wholeheartedly, Dr. Sarvis, that we need to be looking at uh, at much more. But the, clo the the school thing, the timing on that is has to do with the process, and and and. If, and, and we don't want to. We don't want to be caught a, a year from now saying, "Oh, we should have considered closing the school. It's too late now." Can I just remind us that about a year ago, perhaps, we received a report, and I can't remember the author if it was Ficmat or where it came from, but it was about declining enrollment schools and the th and the or districts and the challenges they face, and it was like almost like a ten-step plan of all the different things that we need to be looking at and. School closure was certainly one of those items. I don't know if maybe we ought to bring that back to the forefront or you know share that again because there were a lot of helpful suggestions on there. I, I remember marking it up and putting it somewhere, which I'm quite mm -hmm. sure I wouldn't be able to find yeah, now. But it seems copy, to me know. that was a school services document, or maybe, or maybe it was a FICMAT document. It was FICMAT. But it was I found it very helpful. It, I want to say FICMAT, but yeah, I've got it. I've got it somewhere. But it I'll was. Things that declining enrollment districts need to be considering. It included I mean, the it? examination of redevelopment money. Um, it was that document, yeah. oh, and that the might help you. That Matt document that came to us as their report. No, no, no. this was an article I'm talking about. Oh. But there's oh. both. We also have what right. they've given us in the past, right. and perhaps we bring all of that together, and you know. Maybe this needs to rise to the level of, of a public workshop because I think we keep having these conversations about all these different issues, avoiding the fact that we need to meet with our community and with our employees because, you know, we have a revenue problem. <laughs> I mean, it, mm -hmm. I don't know how many different ways we need to say that, and there's a lot of people in the community that I think are not aware of what our financial situation is. F7, later on the agenda, we do have some numbers in front of us, but, you know, th these are all things we need to be working on together because even though they may be separate issues like school closure, facilities, what do we do with our schools, ultimately they have to come together in some, some joint decision making. And I was going to ask if there was any way c the county office of education would be of any help to us in the solvency question, sort of in partnership with Mr. Diaz and with some of the material we've received from school services and FICMAT, if we pull together sort of a joint in a, even bring in the community for discussion about this. This is, we can't do this piecemeal forever. It has to sort of come out in a single discussion at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I just want to reiterate, or I'm, I'm not sure if I'm reiterating this or not. I th think I was hearing this in what you were saying, Mrs. Rodriguez, that, um, and I, that I don't, I'm a little concerned about making school closure the top of our list when we haven't really f looked seriously at, at some of the other um, 
possibilities of how we would re, uh, save money, reduce costs for the district. And I don't, I mean, it may turn out that school closure is the one that we need to do, but I don't want to make that the focus of the, of, of our review unless we have decided, which we, we haven't had any discussion about it, that that's really the direction we want to go. Um, I'd like to look at the whole list of some of the things that we've identified could save significant amounts of money. We've looked at lists of things that could save small amounts of money, but I would like us to look at how we would be saving large amounts of money and whether school closure is, is the one we think is we're going to be pursuing or whether we think we're, we could go down a different road. Um, not that we want school closure off the list, but we don't want it to be alone on the, or at least I should say, I don't want it to be alone on the list. Well, there are a number of areas of, of potentially large amounts of money that we could be talking about. Just looking at, at student attendance, maximizing student attendance is an, an area that's potentially very large. Uh, looking seriously at special education encroachment uh, and ratios is uh, potentially huge. I mean, it's millions. Um, uh, and that's simply because the federal government doesn't pay for what they demand. Uh, looking at uh, MA medical uh, accounting uh, uh, billing is something that has helped us significantly in the past. I, th I recall the figure of $1.4 million. Okay. Saved our skin one year. Oh, yeah, and just last year. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, so there are potentially large areas. Well, I don't see these as mutually exclusive, but I know Mrs. Yes. Harder is trying to say something. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry. I just, it, it hit me, the document that I was thinking of, and I have no idea what anybody else was talking about, it was the report on the Common Administration uh, mm -hmm. Resolution. Oh, yeah. And From there was map. an examination. We should probably resurrect that document and take another look at it. But, but, you know, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Stark, I keep marrying her all, uh, Ms. Stark also included a, a potential reduction list that had a number of uh, major items on it. And uh, I've, I've always wanted to have a, a, a thorough discussion of those possibilities. And, you know, I, I think it's time to, to start doing all of these things. And, and uh, sure, it'll be helpful to have Mr. Mr. Diaz on board, but... Well, but bottom, bottom line ultimately is that we already know what some of the alternatives are and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and they ultimately involve, involve value judgments that are only ours to make. Well, I think we need to be clear about that, Liz. She was not proposing those as potential reductions. Mm -hmm. She was uh, listing items that didn't generate revenue uh, and was looking for board direction on it. The board didn't give any direction at the time. Now, I've given Mr. Wolf direction. I've asked him to come forward with a future agenda item on how to pair costs in smaller schools because, well, m my, my instinct is that, that we would probably all want to have students attend schools, uh, elementary schools of only 300, 350 students if it could be done just as efficiently uh, with cost efficiency as a larger school of uh, 500 to 600 students. And we know that there are some fixed costs that you can't get around, but I think we ought to take a look at that, take a serious look at that. So I've asked him to, to bring that discussion to the board. And we're not alone okay. in this. Carpinteria is going through the same thing we are. Yes, and, and many, many other And many other, so I mean, but we have lots of company in this dilemma. Yeah. You have to right. wonder who's growing with, with all the declines. <laughs> Cent you know. Central Valley. <laughs> Anywhere not on the coast. U Ukiah, I think, I heard, is also <laughs> a high growth district. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, it is now after 1030, so if we want to continue with our um, agenda, we need to acknowledge that we are beginning our, an item, our items after 1030. Um, I'm a bit concerned because we have so many from our consent agenda to go back to. So um, let's continue where we are and see how far we get. Well, 
I'm may, sorry. May I ask you about Dr. The, the next item, which is the report on school plan online? This was meant to be a prelude to Friday's presentations. Mm -hmm. um, we we can let the presentations proceed on Friday, or we could even put this in at the beginning of those presentations on Friday afternoon. Uh, so that the board would know what to expect. Now, it would look a little bit different than what we had planned tonight. I, I actually think that that would be really appropriate. I, I think so, too. I had a chance to take a quick look at it, mm -hmm. and not everyone stuck to the plan that was given to them. So maybe if we had the discussion at the beginning, it would really focus our board discussion on Friday afternoon um, so that it really is a report on student achievement and how categorical funds are being applied to uh, improving student achievement rather than a general school report. Yes. You know, wellness yes. of the school report or state of the school report or whatever. Right. Or okay. a litany of everything the school that's happening in the right. school. Yes. Good. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I, I, I care less about uh, the data than I do about the, the prescription. Mm -hmm. uh, one feature you will see in that report is a goal sheet. And that does bring the data into play in terms of the, the school focusing on goals. Yeah. I'm sorry, is it too late for us to add that item to the agenda on Friday? Uh, Timing wise, I think eh, Mr. Price yep. left the room. Well, can't it be just part of the pre? pre 72 hours. So 72 hours. We can send out a revised okay. agenda. Okay. I think we have enough time. We can I recommend that everybody no, take I'm their. I'm sorry, this is a special meeting. It's a 24 hour. Okay. Yeah. But Ms. Malikoff is right. Take this section with you mm -hmm. tonight okay. to bring back on Friday. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're moving pa past item F5, which we will return to on Friday. And that brings us to item F6, public hearing and board discussion of adopting resolution 0607-10, um, Santa, Bar Santa Barbara Elementary School District and resolution 0607-11, Santa Barbara High School District regarding 2006-2007 statement of assurance for instructional materials. And, and Mr. Gonzalez Mr. Gon will present this. Time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, review and answer some of the questions and issues that uh, the board brought to our attention uh, at the last board meeting when this topic was introduced. Uh, this is a list of the uh, current uh, schools, subjects, and grade levels that are not using uh, either State Board of Education approved materials or are not using uh, Santa Barbara Board of Education approved materials. And it's more current than what we showed you uh, two weeks ago. Simply, I'll start with open alternative. They uh, do not use a uh, State Board of Education approved uh, instructional material in science at levels at grades seven and eight. And uh, they are obligated by the Williams Settlement to do so. So we're going to be working with them to make sure that they have the appropriate instruction materials. Santa Barbara Charter, in the areas of reading language arts, history, social science, science, and mathematics, they do not use it. But in all fairness to Santa Barbara Charter, uh, when the Williams Settlement was, uh, was finally settled, charter schools were given the option of opting in to the Williams Settlement. It's our understanding from the State Department that only three charter schools in California chose to opt in to the Williams Settlement. And so uh, Santa Barbara Charter at this time is not required to participate in the Williams Settlement, which means that they are not required to use uh, State Board of Education adopted materials in those core subjects. I, I want to share with you that uh, a, a different charter school, Cesar Chavez Charter School, whose uh, uh, memorandum of understanding uh, that will be brought to your attention in a couple of weeks, we wrote in their 
MOU the requirement that this school is to use uh, State Board of Education instructional materials. We have the ability as a district to write that into our memorandums of understanding. However, I want to be very clear that Santa Barbara Charter is not obligated to do so. Santa Barbara Junior High is a, th that is a troublesome situation. A decision was made by a previous administration and faculty not to purchase health textbooks for either grades seven or eight at that school. We will need to, to work with them to make sure that they do purchase those uh, proper instructional materials. Mr. Gonzalez. Yes. Uh, who will pay for that? The uh, Williams Settlement is written in such a way that uh, there's three sources of, of uh, funding. The uh, categorical programs are a source of funding. Any instructional uh, 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 funds available to the secondary district is a source of funding and a third option is to get a loan from the California Department of Education uh, which we would uh, uh, choose not to do at the present time all right it would uh, be taken out of categorical funds and the Williams settlement made it very clear that uh, that was a allowable source for the purchase of these textbooks. But when we say, but I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is this going to come out of uh, uh, funds that, that the site might, might have wanted to use for something else, or is it basically <laughs> going to be the district augmenting their, already their site funds? It, uh, it would mean uh, redirecting some of their site categorical funds for these purchases and it would mean tapping into any existing categorical funds that the district has at its disposal, which is, a, to be very honest with you, a very small amount. We, in the secondary district as well as the elementary district, make sure that the bulk of those monies, categorical monies, do go to the sites. And so the primary source will be the sites, Santa Barbara Junior High's categorical funds. They're going to have to redirect and, and not do some of the things that they planned to do. Well, I, well that's only, only fitting if it was our decision in the first place. I, I agree with you. Uh, San Marcos High School uh, were, was using a world history textbook for English learners. Fortunately, the uh, world history, for English learners, they uh, alternate years. And so this year, they are not using that textbook. And so, uh, though they're out of compliance, they are not using that textbook. By next year, they assure us that they will be using the standard world history book and will purchase the needed materials to make sure that English learners are using the state, uh, excuse me, the Santa Barbara Board of Education adopted materials. Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm sorry, I just want to ask you a question about that. You said they alternate years? Yes. I, it's not an uncommon practice at the present time throughout the district that because of the size of the English learner population that they'll alternate. One year, for example, at San Marcos, they'll teach world history to English learners. The following year, they teach U.S. history. And they attempt to make sure that by the end of the four year, that a student has covered all of the requirements. And that's not an unusual pattern throughout the district. My question has to do with, so the, the is it because the approved text changed that they don't have it any longer? Or, I mean, the last time they taught this class, did they not have an approved text either? Last year, they taught world history, and they were using this not Santa Barbara Board of Education approved textbook. This year, English learners at that grade levels are involved with U.S. history where they are using a state, uh, a Santa Barbara Board of Education adopted material. So this year, this book that is on the list is not being used. And they have assured us that next year they will make sure 
that they have sufficient copies of the Santa Barbara uh, Board of Education adopted world history book that they'll be using with English learners. Okay. All right. Uh, you, it, it, would be, it might be helpful to explain why it's a Santa Barbara Board adopted. There are no, Very state, good. no state adoptions on that. It, that's correct, Dr. Noel. For, for k grades K through 8, the current requirement is that the um, K through 8 schools must use, districts must use state Board of Education adopted materials that are aligned to the curriculum, uh, to the curriculum standards in the core subjects. However, in grades, uh, or grades 9 through 12, the requirement is that the instruction materials be aligned to the California standards and approved, adopted by the local uh, Board of Education. So that, that's the difference, all right? Um, finally, with Santa Barbara High, they are, they have already, um, previous to our uh, survey for the Williams Settlement, uh, right at the start of uh, the school year, they have already rec sent out requisitions to make sure that sufficient copies of their English language arts textbooks, French and physics books uh, are available. Why were they not available? Two reasons. Uh, construction at Santa Barbara High has been very, very extensive. Simple explanation is some of those textbooks were lost in transition. That's one factor. Second factor. Uh, an anticipated growth at Santa Barbara High School resulted in them not having sufficient, for example, physics textbooks. They report that they're going to be using uh, restricted lottery funds to purchase those textbooks. And those textbooks have already been approved. The requisitions are, have already been processed, so they're on their way. However, uh, what that data means is that at this time, we must recommend to the Board of Education that the Board of Education adopt resolutions of insufficiency. Uh, it is not enough for me to say to you that uh, within a few days, the required textbooks at Santa Barbara High will be present. What the law requires is at the time of the survey, at the ninth week of instruction, if there's not the materials on hand, then I'm required to recommend to you uh, resolutions of insufficiency. I also want to share with you that if you could recall a year ago, a year ago this list was probably almost two to three times larger. And so our schools have done uh, a great job of making sure that the proper textbooks are being used in the core area. All right. So my recommendation is please uh, uh, adopt the uh, resolutions of insufficiency, and I hope next year we can uh, recommend to the board that they are resolutions of sufficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Do we have a motion? Do we want this to come back again on the conference agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, were you recommending that we adopt it tonight, Mr. Gonzalez? Th that would be my recommend. That would be my recommendation. Yes. I don't have a problem with it. Um, you know, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, I will move to approve uh, the board adopting resolution 0607-10 Santa Barbara Elementary School District and resolution 0607-11 Santa Barbara High School District regarding the 0607 statement of assurance for instructional materials. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Okay, um, item F7, report on distribution and use of new money as a result of the state budget. And I believe Mr. Wolf will be presenting is, us with yeah, this an is a update report on information. Requested from Bob Wolf, who is our Director of Fiscal Services. Let's see. Uh, during the, there's sort of an error of admission here. This was designed initially to help the board uh, look at the available money for the certificated and so when I tried to 
adjust this per the board's directions, I sort of drop them off. But it, the money's still there and it still pertains to them. This looks at the new money that was available via the state budget. Uh, the top line here is, is through the revenue limit. Those are the unrestricted monies uh, generated by the students going to school. Uh, and that's the total amount of money. Last year we had a deficit that was a very small deficit, but it's gone now this year, and so that adds to the that adds to the, the district's money that we didn't have last year, and so the total new monies available to the district is about six. The district's combined is about six point eight million dollars. Uh, to that, we can add savings that we had this year. We had some layoffs of teachers because of class size uh, class sizes being down or enrollments being down. We have an estimated uh, savings from uh, health drops in the classified and certificated in the open enrollment. We had a total of about 56 people that dropped out of the HMO uh, one and twos because they have uh, health benefits in other areas. Uh, the budget adjustment here was my misunderstanding of the, audit, of the actuary report, so we found some money there uh, that we put away in the high school district. So the total savings and new money available is about $7.8 million. Now to that you need to deduct a number of things. One, the fact that we are in declining enrollment and our preliminary figures right now for enrollment appear that we're down 328 as of October, the October CBEDS numbers, about 214 in the high school district and about 114 in the elementary school district. That total of money, even though we're in a hold harmless agreement uh, for this year, because of the higher enrollment from last year, the higher attendance from last year, uh, that money that we're going to get this year, that's a one-time money. That's not money that necessarily that you can do anything with or stick on the salary schedule because you're not going to see that again unless, of course, the enrollment and the attendance goes back up. So that's this $2.8 million that's gone. Uh, we hired, we moved one, uh, of one of the layoff teachers from the elementary school district to the junior high s site. That's what this individual is. The additional need for the 3% reserve, that's about uh, the money we're short, plus the money that's been added to the expenses that we're going to have. So we, is, we predict that that's the money that we're going to need. SBTA step increases. Uh, this, this, the salary there's a salary schedule for employees in the district. This, the uh, SBTA has about three columns and about 13 steps, I believe, or 11 steps. Uh, this is the result of those people moving up automatically to the new year. And these are the costs associated with that. Uh, the health cost is the 1% uh, cost that was added, contractual agreement for both the SBTA and the CSCA. We do have a CSCA agreement. That's that amount of money. The CSCA forgiveness, that's the money that part of the agreement of the CSCA was for the month of September because of the contractual agreements. Uh, the confidential step increases are there. The management step increases are there. I'm sorry, CSCA stepped the agreements. CSCA has the same same issues, although their their contracts or their salary schedules are a lot different than the teachers. They do move up steps. They have a range that an employee is in in that particular position and has about five or six steps to that range, as opposed to the teachers that have three columns and they can move among the columns and down the steps. Uh, management step increases. And there's no, uh, you can see in the settlements here, they're, they're not to be determined. So the amount of money that's basically available for use or consideration is about $1.8 million of the new money that came in. Uh, part of that is, is partly because in the past uh, agreements that we've had with the, with the bargaining units, uh, money has been obligated that the district didn't necessarily have a number of years ago or a couple of years ago. The state allowed the districts to go down to a 1.5% reserve which the districts did do and took advantage of that in order to make agreements. Unfortunately, now, you, now you're required and forced to go back to 3% by the state with no basically uh, lead time or grace period other than the one year that they gave you. And trying to do that in the face of in declining enrollment is an extremely difficult task. So this is the amount, this is the, you know, what you've seen on the, on the distribution of the new monies in the governor's budget from this year and the money that's left available for you at the end. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Could you explain, uh, back up where it says additional money needed for 3% minimum reserve, $707,475. 
The, the money, first of all, the districts need to come up with 3% reserve. Uh, when you add new money, such as this, that adds new expenditures, especially when the teacher, when, the, when you have teacher salary movement, when you have management salary movement, when you have employee salary movement, generally speaking, you're spending more money. The 3% reserve is required uh, on that new money in addition to the new money. We have, we've had a number of uh, issues with trying to get back to the 3% reserve. This allows us or, or reserves an amount of money that at the time we did this estimate, we thought we were going to need to make and maintain a 3% reserve, 3 reserve on the unrestricted side of the house uh, and return the lottery carryover back to the school site so that we didn't have to use that money to make that 3% reserve. Ask where the 707,475 came from? Well, it's coming from the new money that's available to the district. And then it's coming out of this $7.8 million that's new, and it's going to be new to the district this year. Okay. Uh, and you just mentioned the lottery. What's the connection with the lottery? There's carryover in the lottery this year. The state doesn't consider the unrestricted lottery as as restricted money and so when it when the state rolls in and looks at the a three percent minimum unrestricted reserve uh, that lottery money can be re uh, carried over and done there's about three hundred and eighty one thousand dollars that was carried over this year in unrestricted lottery that is u being used to make up the three percent reserve that we reported uh, to the that, state is that because the lottery money goes to the campuses does that come back from campuses then and was that money that was that carryover at the sites? Yes, that that carryover was at the sites. So that that's no longer at the site. That's no at the, no longer at the site. But with this budget, with this money here identified at seven hundred thousand, well hopefully we can give that back to the sites this year. Uh -huh. Were there any other uh, funds pulled from uh, from the uh, unspent res monies at the sites? Very minimal. Just lottery. Uh, no, there were some out of EIA. Uh, that was allowed to be carried over as about $100,000 of the $400,000 that was available to the school sites uh, for the report for a period. And where, do, where does that go? That goes into the unrestricted, that goes into the minimum reserve of 3% also. Okay. Again, with, the, with this $700,000, we hopefully can return all of that money to the school sites this year. Any, any other such fund? Uh, there was one in um, class size, Reduction in facilities money, about $19,000, about $5,000 out of library money. Again, all that money can return to the school sites this year with this kind of, with this budget so in, in that $700,000. Can the sites expect to see the, the money that's going to be returned? Uh, hopefully, short term, long term? Yeah, hopefully it's going to be a short term and we'll have that back after we do the, look at the interim reports and see where we are. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Wolf. Quick question, Mr. Wolf. The figure at the bottom, the 1.8 mil, yes, that's available. Yes, that is the elementary and secondary uh, money. That is together. correct. That is correct. So uh, it would be, it wouldn't necessarily cover elementary versus secondary for 1 percent, 2 percent, 3 percent, whatever. No, that no, that's correct. We would have to break these down and, and, okay. and separate them out. Thank you. So, so one should not read this and say the elementary district is out of trouble. That would be correct, sir. The elementary school district is in declining enrollment. Uh, like anything else, in declining enrollment, you have to start cutting expenditures, and there's not a lot of place to cut. The, the elementary school district is fairly lean as to where they are. They have class size reduction. Their class sizes in contract. Uh, that is a very expensive uh, provision of the contract, uh, primarily because 85 percent, 95, 85 percent of your costs are in personnel in this in the, in the di in both districts combined uh, so when you're when you're setting a class size that's that's very low uh, that's that's an expensive proposition in the elementary school districts at the four to six level you have a 27 to one uh, that's an expensive proposition when you have districts throughout the state of California in urban settings such as this that are running 28 29 30 to one in those particular classes. Uh, you have a class, you have a K-3 program in class size reduction that the state will pay, quote unquote, for <laughs> 20 to 1. Unfortunately, they're paying $1,124 this year. The average cost 
of a K-3 teacher last year when I did a study on the K-3 program was about $77,000. And so if you take 20 students and multiply it times the 1120, you come up with about $20,000, which means it was about 30%. So if you have fill, the, fill your class and every kid is in, or it's an enrollment issue. So if you enroll 20 kids into the class in, in accordance with the state law, you're only paying for 30% of that teacher's salary that's in that class in this district. Well, that, that's amazing because uh, we, we it wasn't all that long ago, I believe Ms. Lahari will remember and, and with Ms. Rodriguez, that we, we had a report on that that said that there, because we said maybe we should consider dropping out of that program, and the report was that, well, it was pretty much of a wash. Well, it is You're pretty much of a wash. it's not a wash anymore. Well, no, it is pretty much of a wash. The district is looking, the districts are looking at a probably about two and a half, $2.6 million from the class size reduction revenue this year mm -hmm. uh, to, depending on what class size you want to pick at the K-3 level, uh, you can save that much money or more, uh, but at the cr being realistic to the program people at about a 25 to 1 or even the 27 to 1 that's at the 4-6 level, uh, you're still making money from the state because the return is about only about 2.4, so you're still you're still to the good as as far as the money goes. The problem with it is is in the contract it doesn't matter if you take K3 money or not. The teachers' contract says that the that the class sizes will stay at 20 to 1, whether or not you take the money or not. So even if you're in the situation at the grade nine level that the high school is, where they're giving up about a quarter of a million dollars a year because they're running the class size in in, in the class size in grade nine level, uh, the high the elementary school district you're going you're going to pay for it regardless whether you apply for it or not you're never going to be unless you change the language in the contract to get away from the 20 to 1 set in the con or contract to say if the funding's available or if the district still participates in the program you're going to be funding 20 to 1 at the elementary school district in K3 and the state only requires grade 1 grade 1 is the priority then grade 2 and then you can do either K K or 3 in this particular case, we, we're doing all of those grades. I, I, I have more questions, but I want to yield to my colleagues. Uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and finish up your questions? All right. Uh, could you explain to, one more time? You mentioned that because we dropped down to a 1.5 percent reserve instead of the required 3 percent, that we're that, that is impacting us now. And in, in well, could yes, sir. When if and, and I'll just and, and I'll just pick a number to make it make this easier for me. Let's say in the elementary school district you have a million dollars and that's your three percent, and it's it's pretty close. It's about a million two in the, in the elementary school district. But let's just say a million for the sake of my argument. So if you go down to one half, that's five hundred thousand dollars, and so you're now running a, you're now running a state approved one and a half percent reserve at five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Tomorrow the state picks up the phone and says, okay, you got to be back to one million dollars. Now, where are you going to find $500,000 in your budget when you're losing $500,000 in attendance? You don't have the kids going to school. They're not showing up. You're losing 5%. You're losing a million dollars there. So even if you had, even if you had a perfect enrollment, and you had, you know, you had, or you stayed level in enrollment, the fact that you're losing five or six percent of the population that don't show up and go in, aren't in school, that's part of that $2.8 million that you're losing. And so trying to build back up while trying to reward the employees for their service to the district is a very difficult thing to do unless you find cuts someplace else. In the elementary school district, I don't know that there's a lot of cuts left. They're running pretty lean. They've been running lean for so a couple so years so now. So, uh, so basically, you it's just deferred pain. Yes. Uh, could you explain some of the consequences, or w if there are any, of running right on the reserve minimum, the 3%, because Ms. Stark was saying that we really should have a cushion above that, and I, under I understand reading uh, the, the county office's feedback on our first and second interim reports that the county is also asking us to get above 3%. What, what are the Well, the state's, in in the state's encouraging to be above 3% also. Uh, I, I would liken the, the minimum state reserve, and it runs anywhere from 1% to 5%, uh, depending on the size of your district. The only district that's at 1% is LA Unified. Uh, everybody else is 2, 3, or, or most, most of the districts in the state are 3%. There are some small rural districts that are at the 
or $50,000, whichever is higher. But I'll liken that to my savings account. I have a savings account, and, the, and my bank says you got to keep a minimum of $50 in the savings account. If you go down to $49.99, we close your account, we write you a check, and you're no longer a member of the bank. That's what the minimum, that's what the 3% minimum reserve is at the state. That means I'm living or, or the district's living right at the level. That doesn't help us have a cash reserve for cash flow purposes um, in the case of an emergency uh, or in the case to pay bills. Uh, we get a cash flow that comes into, the, comes into the district, as in all districts in the state, uh, at various levels. Uh, the state starts funding us through state aid based on last year and what they call the advanced apportionment in July and August and September and October. November, we really don't get anything. The majority of our money comes in in December and in April, which is the uh, tax revenues, because that's when the county gives us our tax money. And so the state doesn't pay us state aid in the month of December. The state doesn't, and so and then in January, we may get a little bit more state aid, but they recertify the advanced apportionment based on our P1 report for attendance in January. And so you really get the big, you never get another big hit or a big adjustment in February from the state. You, then, you don't, then you don't get anything in March, and then you get your tax revenues in April, and then you get paid in May for the, for the well second does apportionment. Does the state monitor this like monthly? Weekly? State doesn't care about it. State, state sets, a, sets a payment schedule Sta the state sets a payment schedule for the advanced apportionment and then for the first principal apportionment, which is the February date. They know that the county, that they know that you're going to get your majority of your tax revenues in December and in April because that's when people are paying their tax bills. I mean, just think about when you pay your tax bill. You so, get they when, when, so they only check on whether, where you are on your reserves in the first and second interim? That's correct. And if, and if, and if needed, and if needed, in they do it a third interim. You don't really want to produce a third interim report, which is at the end of the year, anyways. So, uh, and if you're below on the first interim or the second interim, they can, they will, they will negatively qualify you, or they will, they will, yeah. they will either qualify you or give you a negative qualification. What does that mean? That means that you can't make. They, d they don't think that you can make your uh, physical obligations in the f in the preceding years. Is this why uh, people in your business recommend being above the three percent? Yes, I recommend that for being above the three percent for cash flow purposes, or for when the electrical panel at DP High School blows up and you need to go and you don't have any other money. We were lucky; we had construction money that could have paid for that and covered that cost. But if we weren't in modernization when that electrical panel blew up, where was that money going to come from in order to pay for that generator and the replacement panel? We may not have had the money available at three percent. Ms. Stark explained that the only way we can, and at, at, at a point in time like when you're s s determining your budget, uh, spring, you know, before June, the only way that you can anticipate that you are going to need money and want money for collective bargaining is to put it in, is to increase your reserves. It, can you comment on that? Well, that, that's true to a certain extent. The problem with, the problem with trying to do the budget and, and, and putting the money in reserve, and she puts the money in, in, I think she was talking about putting the money in reserve uh, to the point where th you as the board could see how much money you had available to you. And so there are, there are a number of different levels of reserve. One of the reserves is the, economic, the reserve for economic uncertainties. That's, that's generally accepted for the state to be the 3%. Uh, if you have a reserve for cash flow purposes so that you can make sure that you can make your payroll every month, um, then that's, that's, another, that's a designated reserve that you can maintain that's, that's 2% or 3% or 1%, whatever you think you need to make payroll for a particular month. Um, and I will, liken, I will liken this to a number of years ago, San Diego Unified, for example, they were running right at 1%. They're supposed to be a 3% or 2% reserve, but they got permission somehow to get it down to a 1%. Well, everything was going fine until, and normally districts like San Diego Unified and, and even us, we float trans or tax revenue anticipation notes to cover the negative cash balances that we think we're going to have during the year. And in fact, we can only run trans if we, th if we know we're going to have a cash negative cash flow. So they were, running, they were running just fine, and they expected the state to pay them there's the state aid portion in the month of June. 
Well, in the month of April, the state said, we're not going to pay you in June. We're going to defer that payment until July. So they had two months of knowing that on June 30th, they weren't going to make their payroll. And the only way they made their payroll is that they floated a loan to the, to the San Diego County Treasurer's Office because the Ca San Diego County Treasurer's Office knew the money was coming in. And so they floated them a 15-day loan to make their June 30th payroll. That's what happens when you lo that's what happens when you live on the edge or on that three percent level, and the state of California decides to change the rules on you on the last moment. And it was the last moment because because with only two months left in the school year, San Diego Unified had no way and no no shape that they could go out and, and loan money or borrow money from anybody other than the county treasury. Well, is there an account code or is um, that Dr. Noel, could I interrupt you for a minute? These are really great questions. I realize that you're conducting a, b a, you know, a refresher for us, a tutorial for the viewing audience. At 11.15, could I beg you to please bring this item back and continue the discussion? Sure. Gosh, thanks. Sure. Okay, so if we need to, add the, if we need to bring this back on a future agenda, we, we will. You know where I am. We'll find you. We'll track you down if you're not here. Okay. Ma Madam President, may I make one quick comment? Yes. Mr. Wolf reported to the public that we used Measure V construction money for the explosion out at Dos Pueblos. That is incorrect. Uh, we funded that with deferred maintenance money, and we keep a reserve in deferred maintenance just for that purpose, and that money was reimbursed almost in its entirety by insurance. But we did not use Measure V construction money for that for that project. Great. Thank you very much for that so, clarification. Uh, Ket Young's still awake. <laughs> Good. Good. Thank you. Okay. We do have a, a number of items to go back to from our consent agenda. So I, let's I, return I can, to those. And I can speed down. Mrs. These. Harder has promised us they're going to be quick. D3 and D4, the uh, plans referred uh, to a number of PTA activities at schools. We have no oversight or responsibility for PTA. We shouldn't be approving those, so I will move to approve in D3 and D4 anything school-related, anything not PTA-related. Can I make a comment about D3, those two also? If you notice, there's a bunch of candies in here. There are big sticks and bake sales, and um, it keeps creeping back in. They can do it before or after school by mm -hmm. law. Mm-hmm. We can as only as control the school day. Yeah, as long as it's not within the school day. We can't restrict it. But we can try and discourage. Well, yeah. Okay. So we have a motion to approve D3 and D4. Second. With uh, anything that doesn't apply to PTA. Yes. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Mm -hmm. Okay, motion carries 5-0. D5? And, uh, oh, I, I went back through it. There's nothing that refers to PTA. So okay. D5, move to approve. Second. More candy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Mm -hmm. Motion carries 5-0. D6? D6, line one, uh, typo, $18.50 for a trip. I assume it's $1,850. <laughs> Oh, it's a really cheap trip. Shades of Claire Vendler. It's to Walla Walla, Washington, I assume it's. I did have a, a discussion with uh, Ms. Snyder about that, and they are paying for her to go. So it really is only $18.50? Oh, okay. so <laughs> <is. laughs> Great. Okay. Thank that? you for the clarification. Move okay. to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Um, item D11. A number of people pulled it. Go. I just had a, um, this looks very interesting and, and there's some information provided to us and I'm sure a lot of information we don't have yet in terms of numbers of counselors we're, that we're talking about. And I was wondering if when this, um, since it's, we're not approving any particular expenditure of funds at this time, is that right? We're just approving um, that we want to get the money and the question is when it comes back to us or can it come back to us as a conference item in the future where we can get a little more information about what how this will change how many counselors we we're talking about and how this will change we send Jan Zettel to Sacramento to find out all about this he, he can answer that 
Uh, yeah. the, the program itself, uh, AB 1802, is a supplementary counseling program. Um, it's been uh, passed by the legislature, signed by the governor. Uh, the dollars that will come to us will be based on um, our last year's seabeds at approximately 77 to $78 per student, which means that we will take in close to $800,000. Uh, when I asked Mr. Wolf to estimate the cost of a counselor, we came up with about $80,000 per counselor. I'm conservatively saying that we, sh we can hire about eight counselors. Uh, my concern, and I'll, I, I gave you all of the information in the law, which is quite simple on this, uh, this new program. Uh, it is uh, that every counselor will meet with 7th grade, 10th grade, and 11th and 12th grade parents and, and their students who are at risk of not passing the, the high school exit exam. Uh, further, uh, our counselors who went with me uh, were saying that, yes, this is what we should be doing anyway. This will help us to do it as we lower our caseloads uh, to a 300 to 1 margin. So what we're asking to do is to jump into the game uh, because LAUSD and surrounding districts are already hiring counselors and the only ones you can hire are credentialed PPS counselors and I'm afraid in the state of California unless we jump in right now and get out our job descriptions, get out our uh, uh, hiring notices that we're going to be left out of this. Um, so I, I'm asking for your approval of our participation in this program because the participation and the requirements are quite simple. Uh, they will be checked through a CPM. While you await the plan that will come from the counselors in November to you, uh, the plan uh, will further delineate how many counselors at each school uh, whether or not we'll stretch the year for some counselors, whether or not we'll stretch contracts, uh, or provide counseling on a flexible time over summer perhaps, uh, and exactly how they're going to uh, keep track uh, of the, the students that they meet with. So you will have the plan. What I'm asking you to do is to approve our participation in this state program so that we can get a jump on the hiring. Okay. I'll move to approve. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. Okay. Item D 13. It, the materials refer to two agreements, but it only includes an elementary agreement. That is correct. That's, uh, I would say, an oversight on my part since usually they send us both uh, secondary and elementary, and I've been combining the agreements as districts instead of separating them out, and that is not the way they did this. So, okay. so are we going to bring this back then? Or shall we approve the elementary uh, uh, agreement, and then you'll bring us back with the secondary? If, they, when, if and when they send me the secondary. Right now we have two, uh, we have elementary people in place. I don't have a secondary okay. position in well place. Well, then I'll well. move to approve the student teaching agreement between the Santa Barbara School Elementary School District and Antioch University. Second. And I had a question on this on page three. Um, in the non discrimination clause, it doesn't refer to uh, sexual orientation as one of the protected classes. And I was just wondering if, if we could negotiate or just work with Antioch to include that. I'll be happy to talk to Antioch. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. Okay, I think that was it, wasn't it? Okay, so that brings us back to our favorite part of the agenda, coming events. Coming events on November 7th, we have an election and we will be electing two board members. Good, okay. 
that's any other coming events? Board meeting this Friday. Board meeting this Friday. Okay. On November 8th, it will be a day of rest. <laughs> 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 okay, any other board comments? D as far as coming events, do we want to make the announcement oh. now about the joint city council meeting being changed and the expulsion workshop idea. being set? Since we have new board member or members coming on the board, uh, the city asked us if we wanted to postpone the uh, December 1st joint city council board meeting and uh, board president Annette Cordero and I spoke about it. Uh, we agreed that we would move it to uh, January. Uh, we got the date of January 19th from the city and thought that, uh, that we would go ahead and use that December 1st date for our discussion of uh, expulsion. So we have four special meetings coming up for uh, single plan presentations. We have a special board meeting on December 1st regarding expulsions and we have the joint city council board meeting on January 19th. So it's going to be a lively few weeks ahead of us, several weeks ahead of us. Well, we don't have a regular board meeting for. But we do not have a regular board, board meeting, meeting for, for this next week and on, is the on one October the week? 31st. So the next board meeting, next regular meeting is November 14th. Yes, but we will have a a number of meetings before that. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, were we future agenda items? Uh, yes. Um, I would love to get a report from yes. uh, the, the county, um, I can't, I'm blanking on her name, Pat Clevenger. Yes. About Summit High School. Board ha always has lots of questions about Summit. The parameters are never clear to us. I think we need to get a report from the horse's mouth. And I would also like to get- You mean an oral presentation? An oral presentation, yes, please. Mm -hmm. I would also like to get a progress report at some point, December, January, on the implementation of the English learner unit to our uh, language arts classes in elementary. Yes. Okay, any, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Any other future agenda items? Okay, then that brings us to our meeting being adjourned. <laughs>